everyone. Welcome to my rebuttal of the strongest argument against Catholicism. At least that's how Cameron Bertuzzi has labeled it for this interview with Jerry Walls for his Capturing Christianity YouTube channel. Uh, this is a great YouTube channel, by the way. You should definitely subscribe. Uh, I'm probably going to be on the channel hopefully soon to present what I call the strongest argument against Protestantism. Uh, Cameron is Protestant himself, but he's very open to Catholicism. He's had several dialogues with Matt Frad, for example, and Tyler McNabb. So he's open to the Catholic faith, and he's trying to sift through the evidence which is something that's really good. I think other people should imitate that quality in Cameron. So along with talking with people who defend Catholicism, uh, he's also been doing interviews with people who are critical of it, including Jerry Walls. Now, I like Jerry Walls, actually. He's a philosopher. He's written books in defense of purgatory from a Protestant perspective. He has a book defending the doctrine of hell. Um, he's written, what else did he write on? Uh, oh, he's written criticisms of Calvinism, actually, and I agree with many of the arguments that he makes there. Of course, I disagree with the arguments he puts forward uh, today in this interview, as well as in his book that he wrote. Uh, the book was called Roman But Not Catholic, so it was a criticism of the Catholic Church saying that Catholicism had actually strayed from the ancient Christian faith. I've critiqued that at Catholic.com. You can check out my articles there. But for today, I want to focus on this argument Jerry Walls shares with Cameron and what he considers to be the strongest argument against Catholicism. So let's take a listen. To do that one because he's one of the world's most foremost experts on, on that problem. But now today we're talking about Catholicism and this argument that you've developed that is uh, it's pretty interesting as someone who, because I, I would consider myself an apologist, and this are oh, by the way, Cameron's not hopped up on coffee. <laughs> Neither is Jerry Walls. I've just sped it up a little bit because I want to keep these rebuttal videos as, as short as possible. Argument basically contrast the argument for the resurrection of Jesus with the argument for the papacy or the apostolic succession. And this is what what you correct me if I'm wrong here. What it seems like you do is you put put these uh, side by side and you say the evidence for the resurrection is surprisingly very very good. But the evidence that there was apostolic succession from Peter all the way back to the first century, back to when Jesus appointed Peter, allegedly, the evidence for that claim is is just not very good. And it's nowhere near as good as the evidence that we have in support of the resurrection of Jesus. Is that is that essentially what you argue? It's not surprising the resurrection evidence is good, I guess. I mean, it's the whole foundation of the Christian faith. So, you know, uh, it needs to be pretty solid uh, for, for many people to believe in it. So... The fact of the matter is, uh, right now, there's probably a majority of people who study this as specialistic, affirmed by the resurrection of Jesus. But there always have been outstanding proponents. There have always been people who have defended heartily and, and done so with the highest uh, academic credentials. And what you find... By All right, I'm already skeptical of this argument. So the claim seems to be that the bodily resurrection of Jesus, there is more evidence for that doctrine than the doctrine of the papacy. Therefore, we should be skeptical of the doctrine of the papacy. The argument Walls makes as it goes forward seems to be that if a doctrine is foundational for a belief, it ought to have uh, a super high level of evidence in favor of it. So I think the idea here is that the resurrection is foundational to Christianity, it has high evidence, the papacy is foundational to Catholicism, it has much lower evidence, and we wouldn't expect that, therefore it's false. And I disagree with that assumption. Uh, you don't need to have uh, equal levels of evidence for foundational claims. You just have to have enough evidence to show that the claim is true. This will also come up throughout my rebuttal to Dr. Walls, and this will come up also as I put forward what I consider the strongest argument against Protestantism. It's not a fair comparison. It's not like, well, Protestantism is built on the resurrection of Jesus, and Catholicism is built on the papacy. Rather, Christianity is built on the resurrection of Jesus. That's Protestantism, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy. Protestantism is built on sola scriptura and the divine inspiration of the New Testament canon. So I would say that this argument, and this will come forward as I put out this stronger argument against Protestantism here, hopefully soon after this, that if Dr. Wallace makes this same argument, he's also undercut Protestantism because there's far, far less evidence for sola scriptura than there is for the resurrection of Jesus. I would say there's, well, there's evidence for sola scriptura, but my conclusion is the evidence is not convincing. It does not establish the doctrine. So I would say the two main problems with Dr. Walls' argument, one is that a doctrine does not have to have as much evidence as another doctrine to be true. It just has to have enough evidence to be true. 
And two, it's it's just a false comparison. These hyper-skeptical arguments against the papacy would also undermine Protestantism's claims that are foundationally related to sola scriptura, the divine inspiration of scripture, things like that. These notes will come up a lot through the rebuttal. I hope to not belabor the point too much, but I thought I'd get my opening thoughts out there. By contrast, with respect to the traditional papist do, papal doctrine, is that no one believes it anymore, not, not among Roman Catholic scholars, I mean serious scholars. Um, th there's a broad kind of a consensus uh, among Protestant, Orthodox, and Roman Catholic scholars, and I'm going to be talking about the Roman Catholic scholars because they're the ones that are really interesting here. I mean, uh, you know, it might be relatively a matter of indifference. Say, well, I'm not surprised Protestants wouldn't believe in it. I'm not surprised that the Orthodox, you know, have problems with it, right? They, they would happily trash it, whatever. But what is interesting is Rome's own leading papal historians do not believe the traditional doctrine of how the papacy was founded and initiated. That's a striking claim, and it's been quietly kind of, um, I don't know, ignored. So, so you read a lot of, um, of popular Roman Catholic apologetics, and you know they still take it as straightforward that Peter was the first pope, and he had his successors right on down the line, and you know they will name you Peter's successors and so on, as if everybody knows this. Everybody, you know, this is just obvious truth. They cite a famous passage in Irenaeus, but uh, they either do not know or they blithely ignore the best scholarship in their own church. So I'm not sure which it is. I don't know whether it's just ignorance or whether they're setting themselves up, you know, as, as higher authorities than the leading papal uh, historians in their own church. But the fact of the matter is uh, lots of popular Roman Catholic apologetics still takes these traditional claims about the Pope seriously. Tra uh, the leading scholars simply do not. Notice that Dr. Walls uses the qualifier traditional doctrine of the papacy as if there are two doctrines that are articulated. And this is going to come back to undermine his own case, that he talks about how the traditional doctrine of the papacy has been refuted, uh, even by the best Catholic scholars. But then, of course, that begs the question, if those scholars, the best Catholic scholars, don't believe in the papacy, then why are they Catholic? Well, the answer is that they believe in a formulation of the doctrine of the papacy that may not be the same as the quote-unquote traditional doctrine. Now, you might say, well, that's just a bunch of special pleading, you know, you're reformulating it to get around history. And that's not the case, because you can see even in the view that, and I'll talk about this later here in the video, even this view that is articulated by newer scholars, you can see it defended by people like St. Jerome over a thousand years ago. So Dr. Walls has made this distinction between the traditional doctrine of the papacy and the doctrine of the papacy defended by these Catholic scholars. Of course, you'd say if these Catholic scholars don't believe in the papacy— why are they still Catholic? Well, they believe in a different formulation of it. And I could turn this argument around to Dr. Walls and say, well, look, Dr. Walls, uh, modern biology has refuted the traditional doctrine of creation. The world was not created in six days. And Dr. Walls agrees. He's a theistic evolutionist. He explains that in a video, in another video with Cameron. But he would say that Christians are only obliged to believe in the doctrine of creation, not the traditional doctrine of creation then I would say that for Catholics, we're not obliged to believe in one particular formulation of the doctrine of the papacy. We're just obliged to believe in the doctrine of the papacy. And that's going to be kind of the, the crux of the disagreement between the two of us in this rebuttal. Well, tell me the name of this paper that your your argument is it was developed in, and you've, you've presented this paper at a... Yeah. Uh, meeting fairly recently. So tell me the name of this paper that people can go search for if they, if they want to get more of the details here. If Christ be not raised, colon, if Peter was not the first pope, semicolon, parallel cases of indispensable doctrinal foundations. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. So, so the, 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 the claim of the paper is that the papacy is as essential to Roman Catholicism as the resurrection is to Orthodox Christianity, period. And again, the, the defense of Orthodox uh, Christianity in terms of the resurrection, you've got strong people, strong scholars, strong scholarly and academic support. You do not have that with respect to traditional papal claims. That's the point. So uh, Roman Catholics are really in a situation similar to a situation in which they, let's say, discovered the bones of Jesus or some such thing as that. Um, and they go on, uh, you know, proclaiming the papacy, uh, you know, and ignoring the, the academic the academic consensus in their own church. So again, I'm emphasizing, this is not just what Protestants, this is... First, notice that the argument Dr. Walls presents is basically an argument from authority. So he's not trying to show the papacy is false, he's just saying, these scholars, 
and he only lists two in, in this interview, don't believe in a particular formulation of the doctrine of the papacy. Therefore, the doctrine of the papacy is false. So whenever you use an argument from authority, you have to ask, well, what authorities are being used? If the authorities are incredibly skeptical, then you're going to get very skeptical conclusions. So arguments from authority are only as strong as as the authorities that are involved, and also what authorities are you picking and what authorities are you excluding? Because I'm going to cite other authorities on the papacy that Dr. Wallace doesn't mention in this video. Also, Dr. Wallace has not found the bones of Jesus or the quote-unquote bones of Peter. Well, the bones of Peter are buried under uh, St. Peter's Basil Basilica in the Vatican, which actually provides evidence for the doctrine of the papacy. But you get what I'm saying here. There, there are two kinds of defeaters to a claim. There is an undercutting defeater and a rebutting defeater. So a rebutting defeater shows that a claim, you shouldn't believe it because it's false. So a rebutting defeater to the resurrection would be, oh, here are the bones of Jesus. Jesus can't be risen because here are his bones. That would be a rebutting defeater. An undercutting defeater would be something to make us think that the claim is less likely to be true, but it doesn't prove that it's false. So, for example, an undercutting defeater to the resurrection of Jesus is that we don't have direct testimony of the resurrection from enemies of the Christian faith. So we don't have the testimony of the Roman guards. We don't have the testimony of the Pharisees, for example, uh, during Christ's crucifixion and his uh, you know, later resurrection appearances. All the testimony that we have uh, from that early first century period comes from the followers of Jesus. Now, atheists put that forward. They'll say, well, we don't have that evidence. I would say, well, we don't have that evidence, but the lack of that evidence does not disprove the evidence we do have in favor of the resurrection. So that undercutting evidence, whatever value it has, it does not defeat the value of the evidence that we have for the resurrection. So listen to what Dr. Walls puts forward then to go against the argument, sorry, to go against the doctrine of the papacy. He doesn't put forward rebutting evidence. He doesn't put forward evidence to show the doctrine of the papacy is false. He doesn't put forward evidence from the early church fathers saying that there was no papacy, for example. What he does is he's just got arguments from silence or undercutting defeaters, much like the arguments from silence that atheists will put forward against Christianity. Their atheists will say, why weren't there more historians in Jesus's time that wrote about him? Why don't we have more evidence of Jesus from non-Christian sources? And what a Christian, I'm sure like what Cameron would say is, well, even if we don't have that evidence, that doesn't disprove the value of the evidence we do have. And this also is kind of an interesting parallel with, with Cameron and other Protestant apologists, you should know, this will come up later in the video, that they're willing to accept claims of mere Christianity, but they put their skeptical hats more on snugly when they're confronted with Catholicism, which I find to be interesting. So when it comes to the papacy, uh, you, you have that if Cameron would say to these atheists, so you're making an argument from silence, and, he, and to Cameron's credit, actually, he does call out Dr. Walls saying that this is an argument from silence. So to Cameron's credit, I'm glad he points that out. Dr. Walls has not produced the quote-unquote bones of Jesus parallel to Catholicism. He doesn't have a rebutting defeater. All he has shown is that there is some absence of testimony for the papacy in certain elements of church history. But this absence of evidence is not direct evidence of absence. So we'll get to that here relatively soon. Is not just what Eastern Orthodox scholars are saying. Roman Catholicism's own leading papal historians do not believe that Peter was the first pope. They do not believe that there was a succession of popes. In fact, they would agree that the first person that you can plausibly argue was a monarchical bishop in the city of Rome was sometime in the late second century. Now, there's, there's differences. This is the key difference. This is the key problem with Dr. Walls' argument right here, though, when he tries to argue against the papacy. So he's not pr producing rebutting evidence. He's trying to produce an undercutting defeater, not to show that St. Peter was never pope, was never given authority in Matthew 16, not to show that Peter never had any successors either. He doesn't dispute that claim. Rather, he's confusing two claims, the claim of Peter being pope and having successors, and the claim of there being a monarchical bishop, a mono-episcopacy, or defining a bishop as a single cleric who has a sovereign authority, so to speak, over a, a local church or jurisdiction. So he's claiming that the office of the bishop, uh, because the office of the bishop did not exist in the first century or early second century, or at least in Rome, there was not this office of the bishop. Because it's very clear in the early second century church— 
that there was the office of the bishop. He's conflating the idea that, oh, if I can show that there was no uh, single bishop in Rome in the first century, therefore the papacy is false. But the doctrine of the papacy doesn't require the office of the bishop to have existed in the Roman church in the first century. It only requires that Peter was given Christ's authority to lead the church, and that this authority was given to his successors, who may have exercised it in different ways as the offices within the church gradually developed. That's a fine few that can be held, and was held by church fathers and by prominent Catholic scholars uh, prior to the Second Vatican Council. So we'll get to that, but another thing to watch out for then in Dr. Walls' argument here is the claim that Peter never had successors, confusing that with the claim that there was no first century bishop of Rome. The two claims are not the same. Even if you manage to disprove the latter, which I would say Dr. Walls has not, he's just using an argument from silence against that claim. It's not even an argument from silence. It's an argument from authority based on an argument from silence. So it's an incredibly weak argument. But even if you refuted that claim about a first century bishop of Rome, it doesn't refute the claim that Peter had successors who just exercised their office of being the leader of the church in a different or more collegial way. This is opinion as to who counts as that first bishop. You know, some people say it's this guy, some people say it's that guy. Uh, you know, so some, some disputes there as to who exactly qualifies, but that's the point. Uh, they don't think it goes back to Peter. They don't think that there were, there were this uh, list of successors. Rather, they think the papacy emerged historically over a matter of 100 years or so. Well, we do know that the office of bishop did emerge in the early church. We know that. Let me draw your attention to the book of Acts. So Acts 20.17 says of Paul, And from Miletus he, Paul, sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So what are the three offices in the church? You have the deacon, the diaconoi, uh, Stephen being you know the first deacon. Uh, you have the diaconoi, the servants. Then you have the elders, the presbyterate. We get the English word priest as a contraction of the Greek word presbyterate. You have the diaconoi, the deacons, the presbyterate, presbuteros, uh, which would be uh, in this Greek rendering of the noun in this verse. Deacons, priests, diaconate, uh, diaconoi, presbyterate, and then episcopoi, overseers or bishops. Now, everyone agrees that in the first century, those offices uh, were kind of intermingled with one another. So Paul refers to himself as a deacon. Peter was an apostle. In Peter's first letter, he refers to himself as a fellow elder or a fellow presbyter. So even the, just because Peter referred to himself as a presbyter does not mean there was no office of the apostle, for example. So, and as you see here in Acts, presbyter and episcopoi were interchangeable. So it says here that Paul sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders presbuteros of the church. Then he gives this uh, address to them, and in Acts 20:28 20, he says, "Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians." And he uses the word bishop, episcopus, to feed the church of the Lord. Feed the church of the Lord, of course, is a callback to John 21 when Jesus uh, reaffirms Peter and calls him to be the leader of the church. Remember, he says, Jesus, he, Jesus says to Peter, tend to my lambs, feed my sheep. And, the, and as I talk about in my book, The Case for Catholicism, this further cements the calling that Jesus gave to Peter in Matthew 16 to be the pastor or overseer of the entire church. Uh, so, and that's what these elders are called to be. They are also called bishops. He's made you guardians. Literally, you could translate this as, in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops to feed the church of the Lord. You could totally translate it that way. Episcopus means overseer, guardian, or bishop. So here in Acts chapter 20, we see the office of presbyterate and the episcopus of the priests and bishop uh, were interchangeable. At the, this would be in the latter part of the first century, if you date Acts to 60 AD. Which, by the way, it's funny, Jerry Wallace says, well, the, the scholars, the, the, the authorities, uh, they have a consensus that it's this. Well, I wonder if Dr. Wallace agrees with the consensus of a lot of New Testament scholars that Acts wasn't written and was not written until the late 80s. Uh, I don't accept that claim. I'm, I, it wouldn't surprise me if it's a consensus, especially among certain New Testament scholars. I would date Acts uh, to the 60s, because it doesn't record the fall of Jerusalem, the deaths of Peter and Paul. But many other New Testament scholars don't agree with that. But you know what? For me, it's not just what the authorities say. Arguments from authority are helpful. I want to look at what the evidence says. So if we look here in 60 AD or so, 62 AD, 
uh, that the offices of priests and bishop are somewhat interchangeable. By the time you get to 108 AD, they have stratified. You have bishops being over priests and having a particular jurisdiction that priests do not. There's a development during that time, and how does that development unfold? How does it unfold in the Church at Rome? These are legitimate questions, and merely pointing out this development does not disprove the doctrine of the papacy. So let's continue on. Yeah, so the, what you're what you're doing at the outset is you're saying that this is essential to this sort of faith, and so or, Orthodox Christianity, the resurrection is essential. And then to the Roman Catholicism... Christianity falls to the ground. If Christ be not raised, our faith is vain. And I point out the difference between, you know, the, the flow from how it happened temporally to how we come to think about these things logically. In terms of temporality, God was eternally a trinity. The Son of God became incarnate. Then he died on the cross. Then he was raised from the dead. But in terms of the order of knowing, it's exactly opposite. The resurrection was the first thing that was known to be true. Okay, after this happens, uh, the disciples reflect on this and go, my gosh, this is uh, pretty extraordinary. Uh, they begin to recognize Jesus was not merely an ordinary human being, that his death on the cross was not a mere tragedy. They came to affirm the atonement, that he, that he died for sins, and then they came to articulate the doctrine of incarnation. And then later still, they, they articulated the doctrine of trinity. So the order of knowing is exactly opposite of the order of being here. That's the point. Now, the, the point is, uh, the, 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 the papal doctrine, the papal doctrine, has come under fire recently, and so the, the claim that it has a firm foundation has simply been repudiated again by Rome's own best papal historians. I'm not sure the point that Dr. Walls is making here with the Trinity. He allows the Trinity to be a doctrine that develops over time and is more clearly articulated at a later time, yet he won't allow the same thing for the doctrine of the papacy. Now, I think what Dr. Walls may be saying is, look, the resurrection was preached immediately. It was, it was pe people knew about it. They preached it immediately. And why wouldn't they do the same with the doctrine of the papacy? What's interesting here with the doctrine of the resurrection was that, let's say the resurrection was known, uh, clearly, <laughs> was known in uh, 33 AD by the apostles uh, when Jesus rose and was preached, uh, you know, was, was preached in the churches. That's what galvanized uh, the Christian movement. Yet even by the time you get 20 years later, in the time of uh, when Paul writes to the Corinthians, uh, the Christ Christians misunderstand the doctrine of the resurrection. They, don't, they think that with Christ's resurrection, they have missed the resurrection, for example, and Paul has to disabuse them of that notion and clarify what resurrection means. What does it mean we're going to be raised? Help us understand, yeah, we know Christ is raised and we'll be raised, but what does that mean? You look in Paul's letters, he says in Philippians 3.21, our lowly bodies will be transformed to be like his glorious body, because Paul was dealing with a problem that many of the, the believers in the church at that time when they heard resurrection, they thought, especially if, if they thought maybe, well, does that mean I'm just going to be like a zombie? This body is going to come out of the ground? Am I going to be a walking skeleton? And Paul says, no, 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 you'll, you'll have your body, but it'll be glorified. So even when it comes to the bodily resurrection of Christ, understanding what kind of resurrection body Christ had, what kind of resurrection body we will have, that even developed in the early part of the Christian church. So we would expect the same thing with the doctrine of the papacy, and in particular, the authority that the successors of the apostles had, especially the successor of St. Peter. As I said before, this also cuts against Dr. Walls and Cameron's belief in Protestantism, because the foundation for Protestantism is not merely the resurrection. All Christians believe that. Protestantism is built on sola scriptura and the divine inspiration of Scripture. And you'll see that that understanding doesn't arrive till far later in church history, not until the fourth century do you get a canonical list of the New Testament that matches the canon that we have today in, in our own Bibles. And you don't see disputes about the canon ending until Pope Damasus and the regional uh, church councils decree what the canon is in the early church history. So as I said before, this argument against Catholicism, and I'll put this forward in my own appearance, hopefully on Cameron's show, and maybe in a future writing project, if this argument refutes Catholicism, it totally d obliterates Protestantism uh, and its claims to sola scriptura and the divine inspiration of the New Testament canon. But as I'll show, it, it doesn't refute claims of the papacy or the evidence for Peter and his successors, because we have far better evidence for that than we do for evidence for distinctly Protestant doctrines. So I want to let everyone know that there's a thunderstorm happening right outside my house right now. So if we if this stream just shuts off, it's probably because 
lightning struck and I, I don't know what's so I just wanted to make but, everyone aware. If this, if this, right, right now, yeah. So you're they, you're quite over there. Yeah, there's thunder going on. It's crazy outside right now. Uh, so we'll get as far as we can. Yeah. So uh, I wanted to uh, to to kind of further the conversation a little bit and get deeper into your paper. Uh, an, another thing that you do, and I think this is important, and you even say it's important, is that you basically are very explicit with what these these claims are from the Catholic Church about right. the papacy. And those, right. the, the explicit, the explicitity, is that a, no, it's not a word. Explicitness? Uh, the explicitness, there you go. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. The explicitness of these claims and, and how, yeah, how, how explicit they are and just how wild they are. Some, some of these claims are really wild and you would expect. Well, Cameron seems like he's getting a little bit of cognitive dissonance at this point. I mean, I'm sure maybe he's just recollecting the words that you want to say, but it's almost like he wants to say wild claims require wild evidence or extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So Cameron is treating and Dr. Walls are treating the claims of the papacy in the same way that atheists treat uh, claims of the resurrection. Uh, and I think I actually watched an atheist channel that noted this very same kind of inconsistency with Cameron, that he doesn't want to bring himself to say it, because I'm sure Cameron disagrees with just writing off the resurrection and saying, well, extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence. Because the skepticism he's having here, if he's basically saying that, that the claims of the papacy are extraordinary, so the evidence for it must be extraordinary, I would ask Cameron, well, Cameron, what's more extraordinary? Uh, that there was a bishop in Rome in the first century? Uh, that the apostles gave authority to others? Or that a man rose from the dead? after being dead for three days. That's clearly far more extraordinary. Yet the, his, the skeptical hat fits more snugly, I guess, uh, when, when, lo when looking at one, uh, someone else's denomination. And, and I'll be frank, I, I really understand the force of this objection. I really do. That, uh, as humans, we all do this. We make exceptions for ourselves, right? And so I remember when I was, when I was in the process of, of converting a long time ago, I tried very hard to look at other religions to say, all right, well, what is the evidence for these other religions? How does it stack up to Christianity? And I felt that the evidence, the historical evidence for Islam, for Buddhism, for Baha'i, for many other religions, the historical evidence actually really didn't uh, stack up. And I think other Protestants do that, and if they do that, that's great. But I would just say, make those comparisons. What do we have more evidence for? That the apostles had successors in the first century, and the church was uh, led by a hierarchy? or that God gave us, uh, as our sole infallible authority, uh, 66 books of the Bible and Sola Scriptura. It's far more evidence for the apostolic successor theory. So notice what Cameron's doing here as it continues to play. He listens to the claims of the papacy saying, wow, those are really extraordinary claims, and they're not. We would all agree that we're bishops in the early church. It's just extending whether that, whether that went into the first century or not, because everyone agrees the doctrine of the papacy existed, at, you know, that, that they agree, sorry, that there was a single bishop of Rome, at least by the middle second century. Well, was there uh, one before that? That's not as extraordinary as the claims for Christianity itself, yet there, there's just more of a skeptical guise here, which I, I find to be interesting. What, what, what I'm thinking of is that these claims are so specific and so detailed, some of them, that you would need some really good evidence in order to affirm that other than just like, you know, tradition or... Uh, or some some sort of testimony. If we are to so wait, we can have tradition. Tradition means that which is handed on. Tradere from the Greek par tradere Latin Greek paradosis. The tradition means that which is handed on. What's the evidence for the resurrection? Well, it's a tradition that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians chapter fifteen, verses three through eight. He says, "What I have received, I hand on to you." It's a tradition that encapsulates the appearances of uh, the risen Jesus to the to the disciples to the apostles. And the testimony of Paul, of seeing the risen Jesus, and other people's testimony. So it's just interesting to me, Cameron doesn't have a problem with tradition and testimony establishing a miracle, a genuine miracle, a man rising from the dead, but it's not good enough to establish the legal, you know, a legal jurisdictional question about the leadership in the Church of Rome in the first century. It's, as, as Johnny Cards would say, it's wild. That's, that's wild accept these as protestants who don't accept them then there's got to be some good evidence for them but they're just so specific and so detailed the, i would think the prior probability is already so low that you need a whole lot of evidence to basically bring it up to the level of uh, a good probability assessment on the other end of it why would the claim that there the claim there was a bishop in rome in the first century 
why would the prior probability be low? I understand an atheist seeing the prior probability of Christ being risen from the dead being low, though as Cameron and I would both agree that you can't assess prior probabilities of events merely by frequency. So if you say like, well, the, the, the odds, prior probability that Jesus would rise from the dead is almost zero. Why? Because that never happened before. We've never seen that happen before. Well, that's like saying the prior probability of the Big Bang is basically zero, because we we've never observed a Big Bang before. So, so I would just encourage Cameron and other Protestants who think like him, don't, you know, wear the same hat when you examine claims as a Protestant for mere Christianity, wear the same hat when you look at Catholicism, and don't apply a more rigid standard to Catholic claims than you would to, to your own claim. So yeah, I just don't understand these claims that there was a first century bishop in Rome, why we should be so skeptical of that or having a low prior probability. We should just examine the historical evidence as it is and not allow any silence or absence of testimony we wish we had that we don't to overturn the doctrine any more than there's lots of evidence I wish we had for the resurrection. Mike Lacona, there's a very famous passage in Mike Lacona's, who's a great Protestant apologist, uh, well, Mike defends mere Christianity. He defends the resurrection of Jesus. He has a 500-page book on the subject. In fact, behold the magic of the jump cut here. I have Here's Mike's book on the resurrection, uh, and it's 500 pages. It's an excellent book, by the way, one of the best defenses of the resurrection that we have. And I really appreciate Mike Lacona because he's honest in his scholarship, and he's honest where the evidence is, and he's trying to approach things. This is his book. He's trying to approach it in as sober and historical a process as he can to look at the evidence for and against the bodily resurrection of Jesus. So here's what's interesting. that Dr. Wallace compares the papacy, then, the, the evidence for the papacy, to the evidence for the resurrection. Uh, and then he attacks the papacy, saying, well, look, we don't have evidence, we don't have certain kinds of evidence for a first-century bishop of Rome, which, as I said before, is not essential for the doctrine of the papacy to be true. We'll get to that later. But even still, he focuses on this, these arguments from silence. Those same arguments can go against things like the bodily resurrection of Jesus, because here's what's, what Mike Lacona says in his book on the subject. Neither will there ever be widespread agreement on the conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead, since the disparity of horizons among historians creates a gridlock, shattering any hopes of achieving a consensus. So what Mike is saying is that, well, some scholars are more skeptical than others, so not everyone's going to accept the claim that Jesus rose from the dead. Kind of like I'd say to Dr. Walls, scholars will have different, more or less skeptical views, of how, even among Catholic scholars, of how the papacy unfolded, uh, in the early church, but how it unfolded does not detract from the core historical truth, kind of like the historical bedrock of the resurrection, that uh, Christ chose apostles, the apostles chose successors, and the successor of St. Peter had special prerogatives and leadership in the early church. So Mike goes on to say, we wish there was more, as in more evidence. It would be nice to possess greater knowledge about our sources, such as earlier reports about the authors of our four canonical Gospels. It would also be nice to have a few documents dating to the period between the 30s and 60s written by Roman and Jewish authorities describing their take on the events that led up to Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, and the claims of the earliest Christians after these events. A lot of atheists will say, how can I believe in the resurrection? We don't have this uh, opposing evidence to the claims to be able to get a good historical picture of it. And if this really did happen, why don't we have more of this kind of evidence? Well, Mike says, of course, the absence of additional desirable sources is not an argument against the resurrection hypothesis, since the same may be desired in reference to any hypothesis. The question is whether the evidence is adequate enough for building a respectable hypothesis. And I would say the same is true then for the hypothesis that the apostles had successors, Peter had a successor, and those successors were the leaders of the early church. How they exercised that leadership capacity, people are going to disagree about that, even among Catholic scholars. But this disagreement or absence of evidence for the papacy doesn't disprove the papacy. If Say, well, I'd like to have more written letters from people talking about the leadership in Rome or the leadership of Peter's successors. Well, Mike Lacona wishes he had more evidence for the resurrection, but he doesn't. But he says the evidence we do have is good. And I would say the same is true for the doctrine of the papacy. And Jerry Walls doesn't, doesn't refute that evidence. He just makes an argument from, from authority based on a faulty argument from silence. So yeah. tell me well, tell me what some of these claims are. At the time, at the time uh, Vatican I happened, 1870, that is when the doctrine of papal infallibility was first affirmed. 
Um, this was before, let's say, the widespread study of the, the Apostolic Fathers, which was published in English in 1890, and uh, has a lot of these sources that carefully studied would undermine the Roman claims. Uh, so it, it, it took a while uh, for, for all of this, for all this to, to, to come into the light. But uh, the point of the matter was, uh, in 1870, when this was claimed, Roman Catholics still believe that Peter was indeed the first pope. Uh, I'm not sure what Dr. Walls is referring to here. There have been studies of the apostolic scholars, uh, apostolic fathers, long before the 19th century. Uh, there were studies of that long before that. Now, there were other documents during that time that were discovered in the 19th century. We discovered the Didache in 1873. Uh, there were other translations made into English. Lightfoot made his famous translation of the apostolic fathers in 1890. But I don't know what he's getting at here. There were studies of the fathers who were cited long before uh, this period. They believed that, you know, they had this continuous succession of, of followers after that. Now, years later, uh, you know, this, this comes under, under lots of increasing fire. So I'm holding in my hand right here. This is uh, one of the sources uh, of my study here. This is, this is called The Rise of the Papacy by Robert Eno, who is a, um, a papal historian who taught at the Catholic University of America. And in the beginning of his book, on page 26, he says this, um, in other words, the leadership role in the local Church of Rome was still being exercised collectively before the emergence of a monarchical bishop in Rome. So he's describing what was going on for the first, you know, several, several decades in Rome before there was any, anything like a monarchical bishop emer emerged. That, that's what the historical evidence shows. Now, the next sentence is an interesting one. He says, such a view is becoming increasingly widespread. So this book was published, I think, first published in, I think it was 1990 uh, or so, uh, when, when it first came out. Um, uh, yeah, 1990 was when, when it was first published. So 1990, this was just becoming widespread. This was just, you know, becoming more widely acknowledged. And it continues, the evidence here, as with most subjects of this period, is a fragmentary and the issue can be debated in both ways. Okay, so he's prepared to acknowledge that it's still debatable. You could still perhaps defend the traditional view, you know, and the like. But it continues. But the evidence available seems to point predominantly, if not decisively, in the direction of a collective leadership. Dogmatic a priori theses should not force us into presuming or requiring something that the evidence leans against. So, again, this is 1990. He's writing this. He's saying it's still a debatable topic. Uh, you know, you, you could go one way or the other, even though he thinks the evidence, again, as he puts it, points predominantly, if not decisively, okay, in the direction of a collective leadership. All right. Okay, so two points here. Number one, uh, even if Peter's successors oversaw the Roman Church in a collegial way or in a kind of collective leadership model before the rise of the— we know that the office of bishop— did not emerge until later in the first century. Since we see even in the book of Acts, the role of bishops and presbyters, uh, you know, they, they, they're they interchangeable with one another. So even if Peter's successors carried out their office through collective leadership in Rome, that does not disprove the doctrine of the papacy. Vatican, Vatican I never makes any infall infallible declarations about the nature of the office that Peter's successors held in the early church. It doesn't weigh into that matter. It just says that Peter had leadership authority over the church and that Peter had successors, and the apostles had successors, and those are the bishops. So that would be point one, that once again he's confusing Peter being pope and having successors with how the successors carried out their office and whether the office of the bishop could arise gradually in the church. That's point one. Point two, he's making an argument from authority here once again, saying that, well, Look at these Catholic authorities, and looks like the consensus of them, the only, only cites two in this video, shows that the office of the bishop emerged gradually and didn't come about until, at least in Rome, until the middle of the second century. And I am highly skeptical of that opinion, and I think that the scholarship and arguments for it are weak, and we should move beyond what the authorities say, and we should say, well, what is the evidence for these claims? Because I would ask Dr. Walls, look, do you believe that uh, Abraham was a historical individual? Maybe Dr. Walls doesn't. I don't know. I know a lot of Christians believe that, but I'll tell you what, 
since the 1970s and 80s, there was a big change in Old Testament scholarship that went from the view that the patriarchs were historical individuals to the claim that they were not historical individuals. And so a shift in the consensus occurred, though there are a lot of, there are, there's a dedicated minority today who still argue for the traditional view. And they would say, well, it's not about what the authorities say collectively, it's what does the evidence say? Of course, that view, that changing of the view about the nature of the historicity of the patriarchs comes from Jonathan Van Zeters and Thomas L. Thompson, uh, that their classic work back in the, I think it was back in the 1970s, uh, 1975, 73, they were writing. But we would, I'm sure Dr. Wallace would say, well, and other Old Testament scholars who are more conservative in their views or traditional would say, well, what is the evidence? Uh, is it just a bunch of arguments from silence that aren't really that persuasive? So once again, if you're a Protestant Christian who is not persuaded by arguments from silence by atheists or arguments from silence by more liberal biblical scholars who would deny things like the historicity of the patriarchs, you should be wary of the arguments from silence that Dr. Walls is putting forward. Uh, because there are other Catholic scholars who would hold uh, different views, more traditional views in understanding the papacy. Uh, you have like Dom John Chapman, uh, studies in the early papacy, Adrian Fortescue's The Early Papacy. Bernard Green has a good book, Christianity in Ancient Rome, and Francis Sullivan, who is a, a Jesuit scholar, he would have a view that's very similar to Robert Eno's and Eamon Duffy's views. Eno's the only one we've encountered so far in Dr. Walls's um, uh, argument. Uh, but Sullivan would say that, yeah, this book is called From Apostles to Bishops, The Development of the Episcopacy in the Early Church, and Sullivan says, yeah, the office of the Episcopacy arose gradually in the early church. But Sullivan also concludes that the papacy is of divine origin in that book. So there are other ways to articulate the doctrine that are faithful to what has been infallibly declared at the First Vatican Council. So I would say, look, we're only he's only looking at a few of these scholars. Why don't we look at all of the all the relevant scholars? And there's not that many. There's, of course, there's lots of people writing on the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Not as many people writing about the the development of the office of the episcopate uh, in the early church. But there's more than just what Dr. Walls is is putting forward here. Now, is this is this one of the historians that you were mentioning earlier? How you, yes. you, one of the things you said was that all of the historians, or the the consensus of the historians, even Catholic historians, is that yes. there wasn't this sort of established. So this is one of them. Yeah, because people are asking in the live chat, they're like, "Who are all these historians who he's saying are in the consensus? Uh, it, basically, that accept the view that you're espousing here." Right, Robert Robert Eno is that one. Uh, and again, that book was written in 1990, and it's interesting to note that you know, he says you know, this, this is emerging at this point. The, 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 this is emerging as the dominant view around 1990, you know, when, when this begins to happen, uh, as he sees it. Um, and uh, he thinks it is still, you know, you can still debate it, even though he thinks the evidence predominantly shows there was not a monarchical bishop until later in the game. All right, that, 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 that's the claim. Now, uh, another very distinguished Roman Catholic historian, is this guy right here? Eamon Duffy. I'm having a hard time getting it in there. You see that? Yeah, you got it. Eamon Duffy, yep. Eamon Duffy, okay. So this is entitled Saints and Sinners, A History of the Popes. And uh, Duffy is interesting. He was a professor of the history of Christianity and a fellow of Magdalen College, Cambridge. And he was also on the Pope's Historical Commission, the, the Papal Historical Commission. All right? Now... What is interesting about that fact is that right out of the gate, and you see this, he's taking a much more aggressive stance on this than, than Eno, whereas Eno waits till page 27 or so, and he says it can be debated both ways, even though he thinks the evidence predominantly supports the idea, you know, that there was not a bishop until later in the game. With respect to uh, these questions, uh, starting on page one on the, in this book, Duffy is, is, is laying out the claim that the traditional papal doctrine uh, is not credible on historical grounds. So on the very first page, he begins to challenge taking historically seriously uh, the, famous, the famous bishop list of Irenaeus. Very first page of the book. Second page of the book, he cites some of the legends that grew up around the Pope and, and the like uh, that do not have historical substance. And there are also legends that grew up around Jesus. I mean, read the apocryphal gospels. <laughs> Uh, of course there are going to be legends in early history. They, well, there are legends going around the Pope, so we can't trust the historical data related to the papacy. What about the historical legends about Jesus? What about the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus is a five-year-old boy, he brings clay pigeons to life, he kills a little boy, and then brings him back to life? What about the Gospel of Peter, uh, that says that at the resurrection, uh, 
uh, angels come down from heaven and they're giants, and Jesus comes out of the tomb and he's a giant, and the cross, the cross starts talking in the Gospel of Peter at the very end. You know, the Father says, have you preached to those who sleep? The cross says, yay, I have. So there are legends about Jesus in the in the early church that developed, but that doesn't take away from the historical evidence for what we do believe about Jesus. Oh, and a note about the Gospel of Peter. I've said that for a while, and I'll still hold to that view somewhat, that the Gospel of Peter has a talking, that the cross appears. The Apocryphal Gospel of Peter is dated. Other pe- Most people would date it to the, the second century. Some try to date it earlier. Uh, it's sometimes very early to the first century. I think Bart Ehrman does. Uh, Gospel of Peter, Apocryphal Gospel, was not written by Peter. That's full of legendary accounts. At the end of it, it seems like the cross is at in the tomb, and it talks to people. Uh, Mark Goodacre, who's an excellent New Testament scholar, says that uh, the Greek may actually be not saying the cross, but the crucified one, and so it's Jesus, but it's still up in the air. It's debatable, uh, if you will. So my point with Walls is that, Dr. Walls, okay, there's legends about the early papacy. Doesn't disprove the papacy. There are legends about Jesus. Doesn't disprove the resurrection or the divinity of Christ. And it continues as follows. These stories were to be accepted as sober history by some of the greatest minds of the Church, Origen, Ambrose, Augustine, but they are pious romance, not history, and the fact is that we have no reliable accounts either of Peter's later life or the manner or place of his death. Neither Peter nor Paul founded the Church at Rome, for there were Christians in the city before either of the apostles set foot there. Nor can we assume, as Irenaeus did, that the apostles established there a succession of bishops to carry on their work in the city. For all the indications are that there was no single bishop at Rome for almost a century after the death of the apostles. In fact, wherever we turn, the solid outlines of the Petrine succession at Rome seem to blur and dissolve. Okay, first I would say that an apostle does not have to be the very first Christian in a community of believers in order to found the church there. You could already have Christians meeting in household churches led by presbyters without being a formal church that has been established. You had people where the gospel is preached, they begin to meet in house churches, you have a, a, a priest, a presbyter, or an elder who leads them and presides over the Eucharistic service. Uh, but then, once there are sufficient numbers of Christians within those areas, you would have an apostle uh, incorporated so to speak. So they found it in the sense that it get, he gives a stamp of approval upon that community. It doesn't have to be that Paul and Peter just showed up there. They were the first people to set foot there, like Neil Armstrong on the moon or something like that, and then established the church, and then it, then it grew from there. That's not a way of looking at church history. Second, this ske- really skeptical claim about Peter's connection to Rome. What's funny is you can read Protestant scholars who have a far less skeptical view of the matter. Uh, Sean McDowell, for example, Sean is the son, he's a great guy, by the way, Sean is the son of Josh McDowell, uh, who wrote More Than a Carpenter, a very famous Protestant apologist, well, an apologist for mere Christianity. Sean wrote, actually, the definitive treatment on the fate of the Twelve Apostles. So Sean, he did a whole PhD dissertation on this, wondering, okay, well, what happened to all Twelve Apostles? We heard they were martyred for Jesus. Can we prove that? And so Sean says, when it comes to Peter in Rome, he says, it is historically very probable that Peter was in Rome for at least some period of time. And if you watch my videos dealing with Mike Winger uh, and his arguments against the papacy, I go into that in even more detail. Uh, D.A. Carson, Douglas Moo, very prominent Protestant scholars, they say that Peter was in Rome at about 63 uh, AD, which they date as the, the beginning, sorry, the composition of First Peter. Also, if we're going to talk about the work of Eamon Duffy, uh, we should also quote the other things that Duffy writes in his book, uh, Saints and Sinners, which is a, is a history of the papacy. So what does Duffy say? What does his scholarship lead him to conclude? He says, in the beginning of the book, Peter is the leader, or at any rate, the spokesman of the apostles. He says in page five, the office of Peter to proclaim the church's faith and to guard and nourish that faith would lie at the self-understanding of the Roman community and their bishop, in which it was believed the responsibilities and the privilege of the apostle had been perpetuated. Duffy goes on to say, it is hard to account for the continuing interest in Peter in the Gospels and Acts unless Peter's authority continued to be meaningful after his death. So the idea that the early church was very uh, was wondered about Peter 
he figures so much in the New Testament, well, because Peter's authority was present in the early church. Even when you look in the New Testament, Paul makes it very clear. He says, I oppose Peter to his face in Galatians 2. Paul is making an argument saying, look, I didn't get this from human traditions. And he says, Paul says in Galatians, I'm not pleasing people. I'm not trying to please people. I'm not even trying to please Peter. Well, who cares about Peter? because he's the leader of the church. That's why Paul's authority, he can even go against the head honcho when he feels like the head honcho, he hasn't erred in theology, but he did act hypocritically. He erred in his personal conduct. Also in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul talks about uh, the right to take along sister wives or female traveling companions. And he talks about, do we not have this right as apostles or as the brethren of the Lord or even as Peter? And he does this ascending crescendo where Peter once again is singled out as having unique authority in the church. So we should let these scholars speak, but just because they're more skeptical about the development of the episcopacy, it doesn't follow that they did that there's no good evidence for the doctrine of the papacy. Now what's remarkable about that is unlike Eno, who kind of, you know, says well it's still debate, even though Eno thinks it's pretty clear which direction the evidence goes, this guy says it's very clear, it's not even really a disputable matter uh, as he sees it, that there was no bishop in Rome until uh, you know later in uh, in the second century. So, again, I emphasize, you know, I'm citing only the Roman Catholic historians. Now, that's, that's pretty telling, and uh, again, so far as I'm aware, this represents the consensus among, among Catholic historians that Peter was not, okay, he was not the first bishop of Rome. There was not a continuous succession of bishops following Peter, as Vatican I would have it. That is not the case. And, and as they tell the story, what you have in so he had but remember he hasn't shown from any of this evidence that there were no successors the are the critical catholic scholars are only skeptical 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 about the existence of a single bishop in the first century of rome and a successor uh carrying out his office in that way not necessarily a successor of peter carrying out his office in the church as maybe a fellow presbyter a fellow priest but kind of like a chief presbyter who operates collegially with with others as we'll get to that evidence here shortly in early rome are multiple bishops multiple elders and again the idea is that the city of rome uh, features what what um, what Peter Lampe he calls a fractionated situation. So you have the church scattered in various pockets. So you read the 16th chapter of Rome, and he talks about the church that meets in Priscilla and Aquila's house. And he mentions four or five other churches, and uh, Lampe says there's reason to think there's probably at least eight, if you take all the implications. Okay? You've got eight churches, and again, you've got the house churches scattered throughout the city uh, of Rome. And it, it, it was in that situation uh, that, that you have multiple leadership, you have multiple people, multiple elders, more than one bishop, uh, and the like, and it was, again, not until late second century, when uh, the pressures of doctrinal heresy and things like that uh, moved on the church, that they uh, that they moved to, uh, you know, elevate one person. And okay, first, there's going to be an inconsistency here, when the claim is that in Rome, you don't have pressures to elevate someone to being a bishop until the middle of the second century, when by the early 2nd century, by 108 AD, the evidence is clear from St. Ignatius of Antioch that the office of the bishop, of having a single bishop, had been established for a long time. So why would Rome be any different than these other communities where there is a single bishop? To borrow Cameron's appeal to prior probability, if other major cities, other major churches at, in the early 2nd century, 50 years before the papacy supposedly developed, had a single bishop, then that raises the prior probability that Rome had a single bishop leading it as well. Though, as I said before, and as we'll see, it doesn't mean that in the late first century, for example, the Roman church wasn't led by a group of presbyters, one of whom was the chief presbyter, uh, who was the successor of St. Peter. Also, I would like to add that Lampe is a Protestant scholar, not a Catholic scholar. So while Jerry Walls has been talking about Catholic scholars just in that, Lampe is a uh, older Protestant scholar. And a lot of this seems reminiscent of Protestant scholarship that tried to show that the early church was kind of a pristine and primitive collection of believers who were all equal in rank, so to speak. You had the apostles, of course, but everybody else was was equal in their authority, and so there were all these different churches that popped up. There was not a single church. There were different churches. You know, there's different churches in Rome and churches in other areas. But even Protestant scholars reject that view that there were multiple churches led in this kind of 
fractured way. Of course, in a when you have Roman persecution, you're going to have different house churches that don't meet with one another that operate secretly. But D.A. Carson, a very, very good Protestant scholar, uh, here's what he says, actually. He notices this. He says, only church, ecclesia in the singular. So he says, only the singular word, singular word church is used for the congregation of all believers in one city. Never churches. You never hear about churches in the different cities, just the church. There is one church. One reads of churches in Galatia, which was a region. It was not a city. It was a region, you know, the region of Galatia. But of the church in Ante- the church in Antioch, or Jerusalem, or Ephesus. Thus it is possible, though not certain, that a single elder may have exercised authority in relation to one house group, a house group that in some cases constituted part of the citywide church, so that the individual elder would nevertheless be one of many in that citywide church taken as a whole. So you would have elders over uh, house churches, but not that they are fractured churches. You have the church. So you have multiple elders within a city, and you would have either a bishop presiding over the elders, as we see in the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch, or a chief elder, a chief presbyter uh, carrying out the duties within that city. But not that you have separate churches, you still have just one church that's overseen and a singular leadership growing from that. Even then, again, having a bishop at Rome, okay, that's not enough. I mean, merely having a bishop, that's not nearly enough to say you got a pope. I mean, I mean, having, having a monarchical bishop in Rome is not enough to have a pope. It's a necessary, but it's hardly a sufficient condition. And again, it's interesting. And so heads I win, tails you lose. So even if you could show there was a first century bishop of Rome, that's not enough for the papacy. But there was no such bishop. So it's an interesting kind of argument here. But there were other places that had bishops before Rome did, which is really interesting. So so uh, one, of the most, uh, one of the most interesting pieces of evidence. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. It should make us very cr- skeptical of the idea that there was no bishop in Rome when there were bishops in all the other churches that Ignatius of Antioch is writing to. So I'll let Jerry talk about... Um, Dr. Wallace talk about St. Ignatius of Antioch. Um, that, that is often cited in this regard is, is Ignatius and his seven letters. And um, what's fascinating is in these seven letters, there's like at least 40 references to the bishop. I mean, he's really obsessed, you might say, with episcopal power, with, with, with bishop's authority and the like. But here's what's fascinating. All of these... 40 or so, some references to the bishop and his importance and his authority occur in just six of the letters. There's only one of them where you do not have a mention of a bishop. And again, it's very striking, and this is one of the pieces of evidence that historians find very striking. The one, the the, the letter written to Rome, is the one where there's no bishop mentioned. So others, other other churches, he, he mentions the bishop. But in Rome, where you supposedly have the bishop of bishops residing, he doesn't mention a bishop. Now, Roman Catholics, you know, attempt to explain this various ways. Well, he didn't mention him because he was trying to protect the bishop. He was afraid that if he mentioned him, he would, in, you know, endanger him, you know, things like that. Uh, I, I kind of worry that that's a, a kind of argument from silence. Exactly. And it's highly speculative and, uh, you know, no evidence whatever to support it other than your a priori dogmatic commitment to papal, papal theology. Well, no, I was I was saying that the uh, the argument that you gave about Irenaeus not including letters to bishop or, or including bishops' names and everything in his letter to Rome that kind of sounds like a, an argument from silence. Now, how so? I, I'm not sure I'm getting it. Uh, so, so, so he mentions bishops in every other letter. He's almost obsessed with the authority of the bishop. It's like forty some references scattered throughout these letters. But when he writes to Rome, where supposedly the bishop of bishops lives, he doesn't mention a bishop. That's well, I think it would still fall under the headache. It's so, I, so I don't think that every argument from silence is necessarily a bad one. I'm just saying that it kind of falls under that heading. So if you could build an argument that says right, we right. would expect him to say this or mention these people, that's, if that's, we can build that expectation, then the argument, whatever you call it, doesn't matter. If the argument it, is good, exactly, it doesn't Exactly. And, and I think the way, he, the way he talks about the bishop in the other six letters is precisely what leads you to think if there were a bishop in Rome, especially a bishop as important as Roman Catholics say, he would certainly be mentioned. That's what I'm saying. Okay, Cameron is absolutely right here. This is an argument from silence, and it is an incredibly weak argument from silence. I have never been impressed with this argument, and it really boggles my mind even that someone like Eno or Duffy or even Catholic historians would buy into this kind of argument. Because here's the thing. 
Uh, so okay, so the bishop of Rome, the bishop is not mentioned in the letter to the Romans, but he's mentioned uh, in the other Ignatian correspondence. But if the letter to Rome is different in highly relevant aspects than the other letters St. Ignatius writes, then we have good grounds for thinking that it would be different, and maybe the bishop would not be mentioned. Let me give you a few examples of those differences. First, the other letters that Ignatius writes to, like, the Tralians or the Smyrnians uh, or the Ephesians, whoever it may be, he's always correcting them, saying, obey your bishop, obey your bishop, obey your bishop, don't fall into schism, don't fall into to sedition, whatever it might be, obey your bishop. He's correcting them. But then when he writes to Rome, he simply sa- he doesn't correct them at all. Instead, he does something he doesn't do in any of his other letters. He heaps effusive praise onto the church at Rome. He says the church at Rome is worthy of praise, worthy of obtaining her every desire, worthy of being deemed holy. He says the church at Rome presides in love uh, over the other churches. Now, that Greek word presiding that Ignatius uses, he uses it in another letter to the Magnesians. And there, to the church at Magnesia, he says, your bishop presides in the place of God. So he always uses the word presiding in a leadership faculty in the church. So just as the Bishop of Magnesia leads the church at Magnesia, the Church of Rome presides or leads over the other churches. Well, he only says the Church at Rome. He doesn't say the Bishop of Rome, Trent. Why doesn't he do that? Well, we should be skeptical here. We should be highly skeptical of the idea that there was no bishop at Rome, because for Ignatius of Antioch, if you did not have a bishop, you were not a church. You're not a real church without a bishop. Here's what he says to the letter to the Tralians. St. Ignatius says, In like manner, let all reverence the deacons as an appointment of Jesus Christ, and the bishop as Jesus Christ, who is the Son of the Father, and the presbyters as the Sanhedrin of God. Oops, Sanhedrin. (laughs) Fix that there. Uh, An assembly of the apostles. Apart from these, there is no church. So when Ignatius writes to the Tralians, he says, you got to have deacons, you got to have presbyters. So uh, the the deacons are an appointment by Jesus himself. The presbyters are kind of like the Sanhedrin, if you will. They're like the Council of Elders. But you also got to have a bishop. You got to have deacons, bishop, presbyters. Apart from these, there is no church. So for Ignatius, if you don't have these three offices, you are not a church. And in particular, you got to have a bishop because you need to obey the bishop. Just as Jesus Christ obeys the Father, you got to obey your bishop. So if, apart from these, there is no church. But then why does Ignatius of Antioch, he heaps all of this praise on the church at Rome. If Rome had no bishop, it wouldn't even be a real church. And what he's telling them in this letter, he's saying, don't rescue me. Don't try to come after me. Don't try to intervene. Ignatius is being taken to Rome for martyrdom at this point. And his letter to Rome is, the Roman church is short. He simply is saying, don't come and rescue me. That is all. I don't want you to, don't try to intervene, don't put yourselves in danger. He's appealing them to not do that. And guess what? If they weren't a real church, he could have said, don't bother intervening in my affairs because you're not even a real church anyways. You don't even have a bishop. He doesn't do that, though. He never undermines them at all. So there's a simple argument here. If, for Ignatius, to be a real church, you got to have a bishop. And if the church at Rome is worthy of praise and emulation and is such a great church, then the church at Rome need to have a bishop as well. Okay, but what about the argument from silence? Uh, Why doesn't he mention the bishop at Rome? Why doesn't he mention a bishop at all in his letter to the Romans? Well, here's the thing. Ignatius also doesn't mention presbyters in Rome or deacons in Rome either. In fact, he never mentions anyone in Rome by name at all. Well, that's weird. So should we follow Dr. Walls and say because Ignatius never mentions the deacons, he never mentions priests, he never mentions Christians by name in Rome, therefore there were no priests, there were no deacons, there were no Christians there? No, not at all. In fact, that's a really curious absence, uh, omission from Ignatius' letter. Why would he not mention deacons, priests, bishops, or anybody by name in the city of Rome? Well, Jerry Walls, he kind of laughed off that idea that Ignatius is trying to protect people, but that makes perfect sense. All the other letters that Ignatius was writing were to churches in Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey. Rome was, I think, the farthest away church he was writing to. And he's under guard. And he said that the Roman centurions are like angry leopards who mete out punishment. They're very harsh. So imagine if they got a hold of, of a letter 
from him saying, I greet you, Bishop of Rome, so-and-so, which he does in his other letters, or give my regards to this believer, so-and-so. Aha, I've got names now. I can go arrest people. It makes perfect sense. And I have this picture up here of Richard Bauckham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. In this book, uh, Bauckham makes the argument that in the Gospel of Mark, Mark leaves the names of many people out. He refers to them only by a title or a vague description. He doesn't refer to people by name, because in the early church, these people would have been in danger from Roman authorities. And so that's an argument Bauckham, who's a Protestant scholar, makes for Mark, saying that Mark purposely left out some names to protect people from the Romans. So if Mark did that, it makes perfect sense Ignatius would do that. So the fact that Ignatius doesn't mention the Bishop of Rome doesn't prove there was no bishop there any more than the fact that, uh, you know, Jerry Wall says, well, there were just a bunch of elders there. Well, Ignatius never mentions the elders. He never mentions the presbyters. That doesn't prove there are no presbyters. He never mentions a person. The only person in the letter to the Romans that Ignatius mentions is Crocus, who was back in Ephesus, not in Rome. He doesn't mention anybody else in the church by name. So it makes perfect sense to me. Ignatius doesn't mention this in order to protect people. So if this is the best argument you've got to show there was no bishop in Rome, it is a colossal failure of an argument of silence from, from my opinion. And so a, a lot of people in the live chat, I'm still keeping an eye on it as I, as I can, as you're, as you're getting through the, the, the basics of the, of the argument. And one of the things that they're saying, we, we just went through some of the evidence. We went through Irenaeus. What's some more evidence besides the fact that these historians, you, you say that these historians, most historians side with you. What are some more key pieces of evidence that, that these historians appeal to? Well, again, uh, other other witnesses who were who were writing about the church at Rome, you got Clement, um, who lived in, a, in the late 90s, probably. I've already mentioned Ignatius, the shepherd of Hermas. Uh, and then you got Justin Martyr, who lived uh, in, in the later part of the second century. All of these people were observers of the Church of Rome. All of them were participants in the Church of Rome. All of them described the leadership of Rome uh, in this in the same sort of way as as multiple persons. And again, there's an, often uh, an interchange between elders and bishops. They use those terms more or less interchangeably. So you don't have any any kind of a clear sense with most of them of anything like like a bishop. Uh, but again, uh, used interchangeably and. Um, uh, where, where you got all these witnesses there, but there's not a single, you know, exception uh, among these people that would support the traditional papal theology. Okay, so notice once again, traditional papal theology versus the doctrine of the papacy. So that's going to come up, especially when I quote these other Catholic scholars who firmly agree that the papacy is a divine institution, but they disagree about how it arose, just like th that Christian scholars would agree the Trinity is foundational for Christianity, but how Christians came to understand the Trinity, when you read the early Church Fathers, they do not have the vocabulary that is necessary to fully explicate the Trinity, uh, not until later ecumenical councils. Yet they still believed in it. It's only people like anti-Trinitarians, like Jehovah's Witnesses, who will impose a certain rigid framework of reading on them to try to get the early Church Fathers to say something that they, they didn't mean. But even here with the papacy, all we're getting still are just more arguments from silence, citing these other, these other figures. Let's look at one of them. Let's look at uh, Clement, First Clement, written, some people say, the late 90s, but it actually could have been earlier. It could have been in the 60s, based on certain clues within the document. If it was written earlier, actually, in the 60s, then Clement may not have actually been the uh, the chief presbyter or bishop of Rome at the time that he wrote it. He might have been a corresponding secretary for the church at Rome, writing on behalf of the church at Rome. Maybe he was just the most eloquent writer that they had, and so they tasked him with this of composing a letter on behalf of the church at Rome. Uh, but it's clear then, when we look at First Clement, about apostolic succession and the, the unique see of Rome, very clear what we get here. In 1 Clement 44, it says, Our apostles also knew through our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is especially striking if this is written in the early 60s, that there would be strife on account of the office of the episcopate. For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned, and afterwards gave instructions that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry." Does Clement talk about a 27-book canon of the New Testament? Does he talk about Sola Scriptura? No. I thought that was the foundational uh, un, uh, sole infallible rule of faith. He doesn't mention any of that at all. Instead, he talks about authority being found in the apostles, but after their death and the death of the people they chose, the successors of the people they chose, that's where your authority is going to be found. Uh, Philip Schaff, who is a 19th century church historian, very anti-Catholic, very critical of the Catholic Church. 
Here's what he says about the church at Rome and the leadership it had in the early church. He says that the letter of Clement gives advice with superior administrative wisdom to an important church in the East, to Corinth, dispatches messengers to her, and exhorts her to order and unity in a tone of calm dignity and authority. Clement was written in response to a a deposition, a uh, deposing—sorry, not deposition, a deposing of elders at the church in Corinth, that they were basically kicked out of office, and Clement in Rome, the Church of Rome, intervenes then in this affair. And so what Schaff, who was an anti-Catholic Protestant, says, uh, as the organ of God and the Holy Spirit, it's a tone of calm dignity and authority. This is all the more surprising if St. John, as is probable, was then still living in Ephesus, which was nearer to Corinth than Rome. Uh, So here, Rome is being sought out, even if the later dates of Clement being written, even if you have a living apostle at that time, because Rome has special authority. Schaff even says this is one of the first exercises of papal authority. Uh, Bernard Green, in his scholarly work, Christianity in Ancient Rome, the First Three Centuries, is published by, uh, I think, TNT Press, so it's an academic work. He says this about the leadership of the Church at Rome during this time, on page 96. He says, It might plausibly be suggested that the presbyters who led the Church at the end of the first and beginning of the second centuries in Rome always needed some kind of president for them to act coherently as the leaders of one Church. So this would be roughly analogous to how, you think about on the Supreme Court, there are nine justices, but there is also a chief justice of the Supreme Court who has important duties and honors that the other justices do not have. They're all equally justices, but one of them is a chief justice uh, who has uh, special authority. He doesn't just veto everybody else. He's not a dictator, but he has special duties that are unique to him as the chief justice of the Supreme Court. That might be a rough analogy to understanding how the church at Rome was organized in the late first century if there was no first century bishop, which still we haven't seen arguments that they're not. We still haven't seen a compelling argument that there was not, except for the fact that Ignatius never addresses uh, a single bishop. Now, in Clement, it does use the plural, we, for example, we compel you, rather than I. Now, of course, if Clement were the corresponding secretary, he's writing on behalf of the whole church. That's not surprising. If Clement were the bishop of Rome, if it was a later date and he's the bishop of Rome, writing, we implore you, we desire this, that could be the royal we. Uh, you know, the the royal we, so to speak. In fact, you look at papal documents going all the way up to the 19th century, uh, even popes, I think, in the early 20th century used the royal we, speaking not I say this, but we as being like an entire royal court, if you were, the overseers of the, you know, being the overseer of the church, the bishop of Rome, along with the other bishops. Uh, But I lean towards the view that this may have been written more in the 60s when Clement was a corresponding secretary, uh, who had this particular job among the elders in Rome. In fact, the Shepherd of Hermas talks about how an angel tells Hermas and the Shepherd of Hermas, a first century document, send a copy of this letter to Clement. His job for his role is to send these to the foreign churches. So that, that adds more evidence to that. But if you have elders working together with different tasks, it really would make more sense if there was a chief elder among them to provide unity so they could actually function as a as a organic whole. And then the what would arise from that, what Green and Sullivan and other Catholic scholars who don't deny the papacy take from this is that the office of chief presbyter eventually came to be called the office of the bishop. So we're all bishops, we're all priests. A bishop is a priest. You know, a bishop's a priest, right? That's what he is. Uh, we're all bishops, we're all priests, but then eventually it came to be seen the chief presbyter will just call him the bishop. We're all bishops in a sense. I mean, the term bishop can be applied analogously even to Christ. In First Peter, it says that Jesus Christ is the bishop or overseer of our souls. So you could say that priests are all overseers or bishops in a sense, but in the early church, the title bishop came to be settled upon in many of the churches to the chief presbyter. Uh, who had a particular authority from the apostles or or something like that. And so what you think is that the evidence basically supports this fractionalization thesis, is that what he called it? Where it's, it was a sort of fractured, like there was just a bunch of people in charge or a bunch of people that were doing church in Rome, there, but there, there wasn't this centralized... There, there, there were lots of house churches, yes, that is, that's clear. Again, you, you read the 16th chapter of the book of Romans and Paul addresses at least five of these explicitly. Um, and he mentions like 16 or so other people by name, and uh, Lampy makes the observation, surely these 16 belong to some other church you know, group there. Uh, and then Paul, when Paul went to Rome, um, 
and, and settled there for a while. Presumably, uh, some of the people that surrounded him might count as another local local house church. So you got all this evidence uh, in favor of the idea. And again, I'm not saying this. I'm reporting what the historians say. Okay, so so I'm not a historian. I'm not an ancient historian. I'm simply telling you what what the what the experts, including the Roman Catholic experts, say about the question. Remind remind me and remind the audience why this is so important. How does this argument work? I think it goes back to this being an essential part of Catholic doctrine. Yes, because because the whole idea of, of classic Roman papal theology, and again, you read Vatican I, where you have papal infallibility as stated, you have affirmed in no uncertain terms that Peter was the first, you know, the first holder of, of, of this chair, and a succession of people followed him, unbroken down the ages, uh, and the like. So insofar as this evidence shows that, look, that's a highly dubious claim, that there's no reason to think there was anything like a monarchical bishop at Rome till, say, till sometime in the late second century, that simply means traditional Roman Catholic theology with respect to the papacy is unwarranted. So, so compare the resurrection. Compare the resurrection. I mean, suppose, suppose um, a consensus quietly emerged and began to be published and widely accepted that Jesus was not, in fact, bodily raised from the dead. Suppose something like a traditional, or not traditional, but one of the more liberal liberal accounts of the resurrection uh, became uh, became widely accepted. That well, what happened was the disciples were together after Jesus' uh, crucifixion, and they had this profound sense of being forgiven. And after this profound sense of being forgiven, they begin to interpret this: Jesus forgives us, Jesus offers us grace, and the like. And they, they later then infer, well, if Jesus forgives us and offers us grace, he must, he must be alive somehow, right? So you don't have actual bodily resurrection appearances. You don't have Jesus appearing to people early on. What you've got is people having certain experiences and later inferring this. Now, what if this became the predominant view of the resurrection? Suppose it did. So, so suppose, suppose, you know, all these leading scholars of resurrection, you know, like like uh, N.T. Wright and, and, and others like him who defended bodily resurrection very, very clearly and very uh, unequivocally. Suppose even guys like that quietly came to think, oh, my word, that's really what happened. It was not the bodily event that we've always taken it to be. Uh, it, 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 was, it was something something like that that grew out of the disciples' experiences uh, and the like, and, and they have the experiences, and the experiences led them to infer resurrection. It was not it was not a natural resurrection that led them uh, to, 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 to this kind of an affirmation. Suppose that happened. Suppose it quietly became the dominant consensus in the church. Could you still believe in the Christian faith in a case like that? If the resurrection was not affirmed bodily, uh, if 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 it if it came into came into existence in that sort of a fashion, um, I don't know. A lot of people have a really hard time with that, believing that the resurrection really occurred, believing that Jesus is really divine, believing that God is a Trinity. All these things that are founded upon the on the resurrection, they would seem to be uh, based on a very fragile, vulnerable kind of a foundation. All right. So many things here. First. As I've repeated ad nauseum, the doctrine of the papacy does not rely on one particular view of the development of the episcopacy. Let that be drilled into your head. Even if we have more of this gradual view of the episcopacy developing the early church, that doesn't disprove the doctrine of the papacy because the church has never infallibly defined how the office of the Bishop of Rome developed, only that Peter was given special authority by Christ to lead the church, and that authority was transmitted to his successors. That's it, and we'll get to that when we talk about the, the documents from Vatican I that Jerry Walls alludes to later here in the interview. Number two, Dr. Walls is setting up a really dangerous precedent here. Then notice, once again, it's not an argument from silence even, it's an argument from authority based on an argument from silence. These are what the leading scholars say. But what if New Testament studies turns into a liberal nightmare in a hundred years? Yeah, you used to, the people will say, oh yeah, you used to have an N.T. Wright and Mike Lacona and all these people arguing for the bodily resurrection back in the 20th century, but this is the 23rd century, people. We, you know, we're, we're the Ehrman school now. Does truth depend on what the best, the scholars of the time say? So he's established not a good bellwether here. Our, our faith is not tied to what the authorities say. It's tied to what the evidence is, and it's up to each of us to determine that evidence. I mean, even in New Testament scholarship today, you go, you go a wide swath of New Testament scholarship, people who believe in Christianity, believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus, there are probably a significant number of them who uh, reject key features of the Christian faith. On the left right here, this is a volume from the 1920s called The Fundamentals, 
Uh, it's called The Fundamentals, A Testimony to the Truth. You ever heard of fundamentalism? It came from here. So in the late 19th century, you had a bunch of people arguing for, you know, spiritual resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Jesus didn't really perform miracles. You had one German form critic who said that when Jesus walked on water, it was really rafts under the water holding him up. German form criticism was devastating to the Christian faith in the late 19th century. So you had blowback uh, from scholars, Christian scholars, who said, no, we're reaffirming the fundamentals of the faith, though many of them brought with them a very rigid, hyper-literal reading of the Bible to counter this kind of liberal, uh, anti-religious, anti-supernatural reading. So that would be the fundamentals of the faith. Like, for example, one doctrine that was consistently denied was the virgin birth. And so there are a lot of scholars today who would affirm, like, the resurrection, but say the virgin birth is just a, you know, well, that's just a legend, or we don't have historical evidence to believe in that. Uh, what would Dr. Wall say uh, to, to scholars who hold that kind of a consensus? Or how about scholars of the New Testament who deny biblical inerrancy? There's probably, there's a lot of them, actually. Uh, does that mean we, we shouldn't believe that? Or other scholars, this is the, the Jesus Seminar, the five Gospels, right? You've got Bart Ehrman, I don't know if he was a Jesus Seminar person, but you had John Dominic Crossan, Marcus Borg, all these scholars, the best of the best got together, right? And in the five Gospels, they said that something like 80% of the sayings of Jesus uh, he never actually said. Uh, does Dr. Wallace believe we should listen to to that authority? So I think we should be really, really skeptical of this. And by the way, he hasn't really produced authorities. He, he quoted from Eno and Duffy, uh, but there's other authorities who would have a more conservative view on the matter that I, that I listed earlier in my rebuttal that we could talk to as well. Finally, I don't think Dr. Walls is really willing to apply this kind of hermeneutic to the foundational truth of Protestantism. So remember when I said that Protestantism is not— the problem with Dr. Walls' argument is that it's not that, well, Protestantism is based on the resurrection. Catholicism is based on the papacy. Great evidence for the resurrection, poor evidence for the papacy. Catholicism loses, Protestantism wins. That's not a good argument. Protestantism and Catholicism are both based on the resurrection. Protestantism is based on the resurrection plus the idea that the 27 books of the New Testament canon are divinely inspired, inerrant, and sufficient, or sola scriptura. So the idea was that the authority for the church, I am assuming from the time the New Testament canon was written, would not have been the bishops of Rome or any other city, the Pope. Uh, it would not have been, even for Dr. Wallace, who would say that by the third century we have the papacy, he would say, well, that wasn't the authority for Christians, the Bible was. Did they have a canon of scripture then in the third century? No. Not one that was—we have no writings from the Church Fathers at this time that directly correspond to the New Testament canon that we have today. In fact, those Protestant scholars who defend the canon and try to make the canon the cornerstone of Protestant theology, uh, even they admit, they admit they are arguing against the consensus of scholars who would say the canon developed gradually. Because think about this. I could take, and I probably will, sneak peek of my strongest argument against Protestantism— uh, I could take Dr. Walls' argument and run it backward, run it parallel against Protestantism. If he says the doctrine of the papacy is false because the papacy emerged gradually over time, or at least the that the Bishop of Rome, that leadership role emerged gradually over time, which I still think he hasn't proven, by the way. Even if it had, he's saying, okay, that disproves the papacy. Well, then I would say, okay, then Dr. Walls, what is the foundational element of Protestantism? It would be the New Testament canon, right? And sola scriptura. Uh, then you would think that that would have been recognized very early on by the early church. But it wasn't. Most scholars today will tell you the canon, not just Catholic scholars, I'm not just talking about the Catholic scholars, but the Protestant scholars, will tell you the canon emerged gradually as a result of pressures within the church and was a quote-unquote ecclesial decision. So Michael Kruger is probably the best guy out there defending the Protestant view of the canons. When Protestants and Catholics debate the canon, the best arguments for the Protestant view on the canon are going to be found in Michael Kruger's work, hands down. So this is Kruger's book, The Question of Canon. The subtitle, I don't know if you can see it here, is Challenging the Status Quo in the New Testament Debate. So here's what Kruger says. Why is there a New Testament at all? If there are no real distinctions between canonical books and apocryphal books, and if some books were forged by authors pretending to be apostles, then what can account for the emergence of an authoritative canon? So what do you do if you're a Protestant and you say, well, we, we can trust the New Testament canon because the apostles had authority, so we just listen to the, the writings of the apostles. Because the apostles had authority, their writings have authority. You got two problems here. One, 
why do Mark and Luke have authority? They're not apostles. Uh, number two, uh, a lot of scholarship, including more traditional scholarship, will say that some of the letters that are attributed to Paul, for example, were not written by Paul. Uh, Ephesians, Colossians, Colossians kind of 50-50 on that one, but a lot of people doubt the pastoral letters were written by Paul. So you have here, what about the undisputed, the, the, the disputed letters of Paul? If they weren't written by Paul, but by one of his disciples, they weren't written by an apostle, but maybe someone in the Pauline school, why should we think it's inspired? What about Hebrews? It's anonymous. What, why, what evidence do we have? So you've got a real problem here if you want the Protestant canon to have its own authority and to be able to stand on its own. So Kruger goes on to say, the answer, according to some scholars, is not to be found in the first century. Because Kruger would say it's in the first century when, uh, when, the letters, when the letters of the New Testament were written, they were inspired, God breathed into them, and there we have it. The authority of the church came into existence in the first century. He says that for, according to some scholars, the canon was an ecclesiastical product that was designed to meet ecclesiastical needs. This idea that the New Testament canon was not a natural development within early Christianity, but a later artificial development that is out of sync with Christianity's original purpose is, I shall argue, a central framework that dominates much of modern canonical and biblical studies. So here we have Michael Kruger saying that if the canon is what we think it is as Protestants, we have to come to the frank conclusion most scholars in biblical studies don't agree with us on this point, but we should challenge that conclusion. So here's the problem. So if Jerry Walls is okay with Michael Kruger, I don't know his views on this, but let's say he is. If he's okay with Michael Kruger challenging the consensus of biblical studies that the canon emerged gradually and through ecclesiastical pressure, you mean the church had a role in telling us what the canon is? If he challenges that view to defend Protestant authority— even in spite of the consensus of scholars saying otherwise, then Catholics should have the same freedom when it comes to the papacy. But we're not even in the same boat, because you can have people like Francis Sullivan, uh, Bernard Green, even Duffy and Eno and the others, They say some, many of them will say, look, the papacy is, is of divine origin, but the and we'll get this, Ludwig Ott even says this, the very famous Catholic scholar in the middle of the 20th century, the papacy is of divine origin, but the office of the bishop, how that arose— it may be of divine origin, but it may also be something, uh, the, di the di differences between priests and bishops. We know the preeminence of the bishop is of divine authority, but the nature of how the office arose could be something that came about gradually through the church, through the decisions of presbyters in the early church. Uh, so even there, the analogy doesn't work because the papacy still stands, even if you have this alternative formulation of how the office of the bishop developed. But here, notice that Kruger says, even if you as a Died in the wool Protestant believes that the canon came into existence in the first century. Most New Testament scholars will tell you that's not what happened. Kruger challenges the consensus, but Catholics, we can challenge it, but we don't even have to. We can embrace it and say it doesn't refute the doctrine of, of the papacy. So uh, uh, tell me, exactly answer, answer this. Theology. Here's one objection, is that the Catholic, and the, I've, I've heard Catholic apologists, and I, when I use that term, I don't mean it derog like in a derogatory way. I know it can be used that way, but I, I just wanted to let you know, I'm not trying to use it that way. Sure. I, I just want to identify these people who, who defend not Catholicism. I like apologists. Yeah, apologists are great. I'm one. I'm one of them. Uh, well, so yeah. good, one, of the ways, one of the ways that they respond to this type of objection and to other similar objections is to say that a lot of these Catholic doctrines uh, were like in seed form back in the early days right after the crucifixion and resurrection they were in seed form there but then they blossomed and developed into flowers or a beautiful bush or a tree whatever later on down the road how do you respond to that type of response to, to your yeah, john henry newman uh doctor the doctor on the development theme kind of thing that that's one way to uh, to say well why isn't this in the early uh the early centuries like like a people uh, alleged it was well first century it's very clear even you and other skeptical scholars will admit there was a bishop of Rome in the middle of the second century. So it's first century. More, why don't we have this New Testament canon in the first four, three centuries, almost four centuries? That, that, that's a, a deeper question to ask for Protestants. Again, going back to what the, what the Roman Catholic Church affirms of Vatican I, it doesn't affirm that gradual view. It makes it very clear that Peter was the first pope and there was a continuous line of successors after him. Okay. Uh, once again, that doesn't uh, contradict the gradual development, not of the papacy, but of the office of the bishop. I'm getting a headache, ad nauseum. I'm getting nauseous just repeating it over and over again. So let's go to Vatican I. What does Vatican I say about this? 
If anyone says that blessed Peter the Apostle was not appointed by Christ the Lord as prince of all the apostles and visible head of the whole church militant, or that it was a primacy of honor only and not one of true and proper jurisdiction, that he directly and immediately received from our Lord Jesus Christ himself, let him be anathema. So here Vatican I is just saying that Peter appointed Christ to be the head of the church, the leader of the church. And guess what? There are Protestant scholars who will agree with this designation of St. Peter. Here's two. Uh, well, more than two. We have here the Dictionary of Jesus and the Apostles, whose editors are Protestants. So they talk there in the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels that uh, in Matthew 16 that this anticipates Peter's role in Acts. I'm sorry, I believe this is John 21, actually. John 21. This anticipates Peter's role in Acts, where he will be the leader of the early church. So that's Dictionary of Jesus and the Apostles. J.N.D. Kelly, an Anglican scholar, not Catholic, early Christian doctrines, he just flat out says, Peter was the undisputed leader of the youthful church. So what Vatican I just affirms, Peter's the leader of the church. Uh, even other Protestant scholars are willing to admit that. Now, they're not going to admit all the prerogatives of the papacy to him, because they're not Catholic. But it doesn't mean that this is some kind of a claim that Jerry Walls is saying that Vatican I makes that is just completely out of bounds with no evidence behind it. The New Testament evidence for the leadership of Peter in the early church is far better, far better than the, than the evidence for Sola Scriptura. All you have for Sola Scriptura is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 is the best verse you have. And even that, it, it doesn't work. Yet you have far better evidence for Peter's leadership role in the early church. One that I would add, a verse that most people don't bring up, is Matthew 10, 2. G Peter is almost always the first listed in the apostles. Almost always Peter is first. Who's last? Judas. Why? Because he's the least important. You can't say some apostles were more or less important than others. Well, yeah, you can. They're grouped that way. You have apostles who were the pillars of the church, for example. You have those who were of more uh, dubious backgrounds, for example, like Matthew, is a former tax collector. Judas, of course, is at the very bottom of the list. He's always listed last. Peter is listed first. Matthew 10.2 says, Protos, Petro, Petra, uh, Peter, I don't know if it's Petros or Petra, I can't remember the Greek there, but the Greek is Protos first, Matthew 10.2, not first numerically, but biblical scholars will tell you it means first as in leadership or authority or foundational, as if you'd say uh, Matthew 10.2, you could read it foundationally, Peter, and then the other apostles. So Vatican I is not expressing a view contrary to Right there, that's just dealing with the Bible, not just with history, when you talk about the papacy. So then what does it go on to say then about uh, Peter's successors? For no one can be in doubt, indeed it was known in every age, that the holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of the apostles, the pillar of faith and the foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to this day and forever he lives and presides and exercises judgment in his successors, the bishops of the Holy Roman See, which he founded and consecrated with his blood. So this paragraph here is not an infallible statement of the Council. Uh, it is a statement leading up to that, and it's an explanatory statement, I would say, with a fair amount of rhetorical flourish. Uh, so it may be church teaching, but it's not an infallible teaching. So... <clears throat> When we see parts in here like, for no one can be in doubt, that's not a command like, you cannot doubt the following paragraph, or something like that. Or saying it was known in every age, all of these facts, including that uh, the, the successor of St. Peter was uh, uh, the bishop of the Holy Roman See. Now first, that it was known in every age doesn't mean in every single minute of church history in every single place. It means like in the apostolic age, the medieval age. This is something that was broadly known throughout the church. But for example, if you went to India in the year 70 AD, for example, when Thomas arrived in India, uh, the Christians in India probably did not know that Peter had a successor who was the bishop of the Holy Roman See, even if there was a first century, you know, setting aside the debate about whether there was a bishop in first century Rome, so let's say there was one. The bishop, the, the Christians in India probably didn't know this because Thomas didn't know that this had happened, that the successor of Peter was in Rome. Because as the Catholic Encyclopedia says, uh, Peter was only in Rome at the very end of his life. So it's not something that Thomas would have known during his missionary journeys, things like that. So I just bring that up as an example that we should not read paragraphs like this rigidly because they're not uh, infallible teaching. And I think that's what Dr. Walls is trying to say that the historical development of the episcopacy contradicts Vatican I because he reads 
these paragraphs as if they were statements of infallible teaching with they aren't, which they aren't. Now, if we go to the next paragraph, we see here that declaration. It says, therefore, if anyone says that it is not by the institution of Christ the Lord himself, that is to say by divine law, that blessed Peter should have perpetual successors in the primacy over the whole church, or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in his primacy, let him be anathema. So what's saying here is that Peter has authority from Christ, his successors have that authority over the church. So this part is uh, the infallible teaching. The second part here would be what we would call a dogmatic fact. It's something that has an essential connection to a dogma. Or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter, because it, it is possible for someone to be the successor of Peter at some point in church history without being the Roman pontiff. So for example, suppose and I you know, hope to God this never happens, but what if there was a, a terrorist attack on Rome? There was like a nuclear attack, and the city of Rome became uninhabitable. And so uh, the successor of St. Peter relocated to another city to, to oversee. Um, or we go back in history, we look at uh, when the papacy was in Avignon, France, for example. So the successor of St. Peter, it is a dogmatic fact that he is the Bishop of Rome, but he could still be the successor of St. Peter, uh, even if it were the case that there were no Roman diocese for him to, to oversee as a bishop, if some contingent fact of history were, were different, uh, either in the past or in the future. But the key here, what's being affirmed, that Dr. Walls has not, he says, well, Vatican I doesn't, doesn't allow for this gradual view. What are, you, what are you talking about? All it says here is that Blessed Peter should have perpetual successors. This also doesn't mean that there's always going to be someone that the church recognizes as being the leader of the church. There's always going to be a period we call interregnum between popes, right? There's a period where one pope dies and another pope is elected. During the, I think the longest period was actually during Roman persecution that we did not have a pope for years, actually because the Roman persecution prevented that from happening. But the fact that that happened in history doesn't disprove Vatican I's teaching that Peter would have perpetual successors, who would have primacy over the church. Now, how they exercise that, of course, would be different. So let me continue playing what uh, Wall says, and then I'm going to cite uh, another example on this point. So let's, let's continue. Moreover, and this is, I think this is really important to emphasize, with respect to these doctrines that developed over time, the classic case would be incarnation and trinity. These are extremely difficult conceptually. In fact, they still blow our minds to this day. People are still trying to make the best sense of them, right? So it's not surprising that it took the church a while to formulate these things, to give them rigor, to give them, to give them distinct kind of definition. Now, the claim that Peter was appointed pope is not conceptually challenging. It is nothing like the claim that Jesus had a fully human nature uh, and a fully divine nature. Well, notice that he says it's not challenging to just say Peter was the Pope, um, but Dr. Wallace never defines what the papacy is. So he never says this is what in is entailed in the doctrine of the papacy or the office of the papacy, because uh, Peter can still be Pope even if he's never called Pope at that time, just like God is a trinity, even though nobody called God a trinity until the end of the second century. So that's an interesting parallel there that uh, Dr. Walls will admit that there was, at his reading these skeptical scholars, he'll say, well, there was a pope in the middle second century, but not before that point. Well, the word trinity doesn't appear until maybe 30 years after that point. Well, we see belief in the trinity, even if you don't use that name, that word or those phrases. Well, we could say the same thing for the successors of St. Peter. So, yeah, maybe it's not uh, conceptually challenging. It's not like the Trinity. Uh, so it's not a metaphysical difficulty, but as we'll see, it's kind of a legal difficulty, a jurisdictional difficulty. So what does it mean that the successor of St. Peter has primacy over the Church? What does that entail? It's something that, that Catholics and the Orthodox still dialogue about to this day. That's why Pope St. John Paul II authored an encyclical, I think it was an encyclical, uh, he's authored a document, Ut Unum Sint. Uh, talking about how unity comes forth from the chair of St. Peter, but how the office of the papacy can be exercised prudentially in a way to bring about unity with the Eastern Orthodox part of the Church instead of driving them away. Uh, so yeah, it's not like the Trinity, but they're, they're not complex metaphysical questions. 
there are complex uh, legal and jurisdictional questions. And, and to note the complexity, Dr. Walls doesn't even define what it means to be pope or what the papacy is. So I, I find that to be interesting in that regard. For him to say that the Trinity can develop because it's complex, but the papacy is not complex, when he hasn't actually proven that point, and that's not what church history reveals to us. And he was one person with, with two natures. It is nothing like the claim that God is three persons in one, as the Trinity saying. It's nothing remotely like that. They had ideas of priestly successors and things within their culture. It's not like this would be some extraordinarily difficult mystery that would take years to reflect on and the like. Now, moreover, even with respect to the doctrines of Trinity and Incarnation, the raw materials were there from the beginning. Even though they didn't have the precise doctrinal sharpness and focus and, and precision that they later got with years of reflection. Okay, so the Trinity gets raw materials at the beginning. Uh, and if you look at formulations of the Trinity today versus what you just read from the New Testament, it's far more extrapolated than what you get in the New Testament. And that's okay, because I don't believe in sola scriptura. I don't think doctrine only comes from the pages of Scripture. I believe you can prove the bare essentials of the Trinity from the New Testament. There is one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each God, or fully divine. But after that, there is a lot that's involved in explaining the nature of the Trinity, generation, begotting, spiration, which would be the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son, or the Father and the Son, Father through the Son. You know, it's, it becomes, there's a lot more that is involved there. But Dr. Walls allows that development of these important elements of the doctrine while letting there be a core at the beginning, but he won't let the same thing happen for a doctrine like the papacy or something like the canon of Scripture, which he might say, well, we definitely have the, the raw materials for the canon in the first century, even if Christians didn't understand it until the, the fourth century. So it's, it's a bit of a double standard here. The foundational stones were there from the beginning. They believed Jesus was raised from the dead. They believed he was the Son of God. They believed he was divine, whatever that meant. Okay, it took them a while to, to, to articulate that and get it exactly right. But the, the basic facts were clear from the outset. Now, here's the point. You don't see the basic claims clear from the outset with papal doctrine. You don't see everybody agree. Oh, well, yeah, Peter's the first pope, and he's the head of the church, and we're not exactly sure what all that means just yet. It may take time, you know, some time to figure this out. But Jesus appointed Peter as the first pope. We all agree on that. His successor is the, is, is the next pope, and his successor, right up in, until the end of time, there will always be a pope that will be God's appointed man. And that's really important to get. So the idea that it's like doctrine doesn't wash at all. Doesn't wash at all. All right, well, this is just silly, where he's saying, I could do the same thing. Well, we know God's a trinity, and we're worshiping the trinity, but you don't see people talk about the trinity in the first two centuries. He's using the same thing by throwing around the title of pope uh, in this way, that it's, it's just not that explicit, as opposed to saying, we recognize the apostles have successors. And the successor, and that's very clear, as you saw in First Clement 44, the apostles have successors. And we see the successor of St. Peter has unique prerogatives and leadership in the Church that uh, the other successors of the apostles do not have. That is very clear from the beginning. Uh, let me direct you to a passage from uh, Ludwig Ott's book, uh, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma. I believe this was published in 1952. So this is a great summary of the understanding of, of the, of the nature of the office of bishop as it was articulated at the First Vatican Council. So this is pre-Vatican II. It's not some kind of modernist thing, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ott. Uh, and this is what he says when he talks about the office of the bishop. He says, The question whether the preeminence of the bishops to the presbyters in regard to the power of jurisdiction and the power of consecration is an institution by Christ directly or by the Church, i.e. by divine or Church law, has not been decided by the Council of Trent. So this is Ott reflecting back on the Council of Trent about the nature of how bishops are preeminent over presbyters. He'll go on to say we know that they are, but how are they? That's something that was not that wasn't even settled at the Council of Trent or later at the First Vatican Council, or even at the Second Vatican Council, of understanding the precise nature of how the office of bishop is different from the office, office of the presbyter. So, for example, Ott says he talks about how the bishop is the ordinary minister of uh, ordination, uh, which, of course, leaves the idea there could be an extraordinary minister, like can a priest ordain another priest? And if he can, under what circumstances is it valid? Under what circumstances is it licit? Uh, those are all, all questions that are, that are open in theology, 
that people discuss. So uh, what he says here is tradition proves the preeminence of the bishop without doubt. Like, so you go back to Ignatius of Antioch, very clear. The bishop is higher than the priest in authority. But the question of, of the powers of jurisdiction and consecration, whether the bishop's preeminence and how that works out comes from divine law, it's something Christ instituted, or whether it's a law of the church that developed, uh, that's something that hasn't been settled by, uh, by the magisterium. So he says here, tradition pr proves the preeminence of the bishops without doubt, but does not provide a clear answer to the question of the nature of of this law. Jerome, St. Jerome, states that there was no difference between bishops and presbyters originally. So this is going all the way back to the 5th century. And so he goes on to say, to avoid difficulties or disputes, one of the, this was Jerome's view, Ah is summarizing Jerome's view in the 5th century. To avoid difficulties or disputes, one of the presbyters was elected to be the head of the others and of the community. From that time on, the conferring of orders became a privilege of the bishop. So even here we have Ott quoting St. Jerome, endorsing a view that uh, Peter has perpetual successors with his authority, but how they exercise it will differ because the offices they exercise it in, whether it's the presbyter or the episcopacy, might gradually develop. And since that has been permitted and understood for a very long time, even if Dr. Walls refutes one view of the episcopacy, that it's a later development, not an earlier one, which he hasn't done, by the way, even if he did, it doesn't disprove the papacy, because even here, uh, he's, he's talking as if there was just this traditional view, as if, oh, well, everybody knew that Peter is Pope, and he's the bishop, and he has these unilateral powers and authority, and we all know that, and it was just recently Eno and Duffy and others figured out this isn't the case. No, even here, Ott, writing in the middle of the 20th century, quoting St. Jerome in the 5th century, shows the understanding that there was an open question among Catholic theologians about the nature of the difference between the presbyterate and the episcopacy. And, at a, you know, saying, is it just the minimal view that a bishop just is a priest, but he has more jurisdiction? Or is there more of an ontological difference between a bishop and a priest? It's been left an open question by the councils, and because of that, it allows for the episcopacy to have a historical view of it developing gradually without compromising the role of St. Peter having successors. All right, I want to do. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. We're about to do some Q and A, so we're going to trans transition to some Q and A in just a second. But before we do that, I want to do something that I think you'll like and not like at the same time. Okay, so well, you're going to like it. You're going to like it and not like it. Yeah, okay. so you're going to like it because it's a. You're going to like it. I guarantee it. <laughs> were there from the beginning, even though they didn't have the precise doctrinal sharpness and focus and, and precision that they laid right up in, until the end of time, there will always be a Pope who will be I like it. Yeah, so there. you're going to a little bit. We're about to do some Q&A, so we're going to... Right up in, until the end of time, there will always be a Pope who will be God's appointed man, and that's really important to get. So the idea that it's like doctrine doesn't wash at all. Doesn't wash at all. All right, I want to do. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. We're about to do some Q and A, so we're going to we're trans transition to some Q and A in, in just a second. But before we do that, I want to do something that I think you'll like and not like at the same time. Okay, so you're going to like it. You're going to like it and not like it. Yeah, okay. so you're going to like it because it's a Plantingian Plantingian type of response, and yeah. um, so I'm going to use some of the same strategies that Plantinga uses in responding to the problem of evil. Okay, so one of the things that he does is he says, okay, look, what does this argument get us? What does the problem of evil actually do for us? At most, it gives us some evidence against God's existence, but what that does not by itself entail that God doesn't exist, because we may have arguments that sort of outweigh this other evidence. So what a Catholic could do is say, well, yes, your argument does give me some reason, some small amount of reason to doubt that Catholicism is true. Nevertheless, I've got all of this other evidence that still weighs in favor. And so on balance, the total evidence still supports Catholicism. What are your thoughts on that? Skeptical papalism. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I guess I, guess I, I don't know why Dr. Walls is so dismissive of this objection. Uh, and I think it's fine for Cameron to, to make, and it's a good way for him to think of skeptical theism is the idea that, look, even if I don't know why God allows a certain kind of evil or I can't explain evil, uh, because I have good reasons to believe God exists, that outweighs any doubts that might be caused by evil that I can't explain. So I think uh, Cameron's applying this to uh, the papacy to say, look, even— and this works because Dr. Walls' only evidence he's offered is undercutting evidence. He's just offered, well, we don't have all these people saying X in the early first century. 
Remember when I quoted uh, Mike Lacona, for example? You go back to, where did I, where did I put that down? Here. <clears throat> Remember when I quoted uh, Lacona's book? Lacona says, well, yeah, we don't have evidence from the Jews or Jewish leadership or Romans or uh, direct uh, certified statements from the disciples or, or other things like that, but, but we have other evidence which, uh, which balances out or outweighs the absence of evidence in, in that field. And so Cameron's making a decent point that, look, even if you don't have, especially with an argument from silence, even if you don't have evidence for the papacy in certain parts of church history, that doesn't disprove not just the other evidence for the papacy, but the other evidence for Catholicism, for the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, for distinctive Catholic doctrines. Uh, now, I will say, though, that this other evidence, uh, it will get you a long way. I will say the papacy is very important doctrine, because you could sign on to a lot of Catholicism, and if you don't embrace, if you reject the doctrine of the papacy, you kind of end up at Eastern Orthodoxy or Oriental Orthodoxy, uh, or Eastern Christianity, Orthodoxy. Uh, but the more you sign on to, the more you have to abandon more and more of Protestantism. So uh, so I think, I don't like that Jerry Walls is so dismissive here, saying, look, what about all the other evidence? You, you've caught, you sowed a little bit of doubt on the papacy, not, not incontrovertible doubt that can't be overcome. What about all the other evidence for Catholicism that it might outweigh it? I guess I would simply go back again and say, look, what does Vatican I tell you? Vatican I is much more forthright. Vatican I is, is, is the basis upon which— And Dr. Walls is assuming the statements I'm sure he's thinking about in Vatican I are the historical expository statements, the ones that have kind of a rhetorical flourish. They're not infallible teachings. So even if Vatican I makes a, a statement about— uh, how people understood the papacy, and it's just a historical reflection. It's not even a church teaching. That could be an error. Not every part of a ecumenical council is infallible. So when we look at what Vatican I teaches, does it have the anathema clause attached? Uh, when we look at other aspects of church teaching, does it declare and define? Uh, so I would recommend that, that that's how we know it's using language of infallibility. Uh, I would say to Dr. Walls, he should get my friend Jimmy Aiken's book, Teaching with Authority, to read through this before he says Vatican I s says something in an infallible way, which it, which it just doesn't. The doctrine of papal infallibility <clears throat> was first formulated, <clears throat> right? So, so you don't have this kind of appeal to agnosticism or, or, or some such thing as that. You don't have this idea, well, you know, God's got you know, some explanation of why this is true that we can't grasp or comprehend. It's not like that. Uh, Vatican I is very straightforward. In its claims, uh, it's it's not at all like um, like skeptical papism you would expect it to be. Well, no, yes, I'm, not, I'm not saying the skeptical papism. I, I'm saying that this person it is a move. I mean, I mean, I, one of my students here, uh, who's written, who's Roman Catholic, has written a paper. Has actually published it, and he's kind of taken that line, you know, of what I call skeptical papism. Um, That's not the line that I'm taking. I, I, what I'm okay. taking is that this this Catholic person is accepting that he, given your argument, he does now have some evidence against Catholicism. But nevertheless, when he looks at his total evidence, all oh, the evidence for, oh, for and against. Yeah. So you're saying the total evidence for Catholicism could still could still weigh in favor of Catholicism, right? Oh, okay, okay. I I, I mis I misconstrued. Yeah. Well, I, I guess in a case like that, um, uh, what one has to do is look at the various pieces of evidence and assess them individually and um, build a kind of a cumulative case. And um, if you think. You can you can come up with sufficient evidence to outweigh the problems with the Pope. Uh, then I suppose you might have a, a case. Um, I think you're gonna have trouble doing that. I think there are problems with other Roman Catholic doctrines as well. But um, yeah, I, I suppose that'd be the that'd be the reasonable line to take. Yeah, it'd be kind of a, a cumulative case. Uh, someone yeah. just wrote that in the comments. You you could yeah, it could be part of your case for Catholicism oh, yeah, or, yeah, or but, against. But 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 it would be very odd. If something that is so central and and Vatican I claims is so clear, if you had to say, well, okay, it's not as clear as Vatican I says it is. It's not as distinct as as the you know the dogmatic definition of papal infallibility says it is. Uh, but it, you know, it's still got some kind of ground for it. I mean, it strikes me as a very odd move. It strikes me that you've basically backed away from what Vatican I says about the papacy. All right, let's move to some questions. I think that was... You haven't. You've only backed away from... Well, not backed away. You just haven't embraced a particular affirmation of what Vatican I teaches. Uh, you're, you're backing away from a view that is not what the Council teaches. You're backing away from a view that is permitted from the conciliar teaching, saying that there was a first-century Bishop of Rome who is the successor of St. Peter, 
Uh, so that would be one view. Then the other view would be there was a first century bishop of Rome who was a successor of St. Peter, who was widely known throughout church history. So actually, those are two distinct views. You could say, well, there was a bishop in Rome. He was the first century successor of Peter, but he just wasn't as widely— he had jurisdiction over the church, but he just wasn't as widely known. I mean, if you have the ancient church, for example, it's not like everyone has an email, vatican.va, or something like that. Uh, if you see in the, the infallible declaration that um, Peter's successors would exist, but how they exercise the office, how people would understand it, that might differ based on different historical— and contingent circumstances. It's pretty much, uh, I'm trying to think of the other Plantingan response, and that, that could be, instead of appealing to evidence, you could appeal to something like, oh, well, I just have this. And again, remind, remind your questioners of my Notre Dame heritage here, you know. See this? I'm reminding everyone of your Notre Dame heritage right now. <laughs> uh, Alvin Plantinga, by the way, is a prominent Protestant philosopher, reform philosopher of religion, probably one of the most famous philosophers of religion of the 20th century easily, if not the most famous philosopher of religion in the 20th century. Plantinga was instrumental in rebutting J.L. Mackey's problem of evil, for example. So they're talking about skeptical theism, stuff like that. Plantinga also wrote a, a lot on warranted Christian belief about how it is we can be justified in believing God exists, and Plantinga, at which Cameron's going to get to here soon, and Plantinga also taught at the University of Notre Dame, by the way, which is why Jerry Walls is holding up his shirt like that. Uh, he's going to bring up the point that planting has said, look, even if you don't have a proof for God, if, uh, where is it? Let me, I can't get up and, and grab the, I see it right across from me, uh, right next to Phaser. I've got Warranted Christian Belief by Planting on my bookshelf. It's like a 400-page book, and at the end, it's 400 pages that argues, if God exists, we are justified in believing in God. You may not be able to prove God exists to other people, but you're still justified in believing in God because of God's capacity for revealing himself to you if he really does exist. That's the shtick that um, Plantinga argues. And so Cameron's about to say, well, could a Catholic use that kind of reformed epistemology to defend their belief in the truth of Catholicism? So so he could say, okay, look, you, you've got some of this evidence. Nevertheless, I just kind of know that Catholicism is true. So you have this propositional evidence against my position. Nevertheless, when I read my Bible or when I go to Mass, I still have these experiences that sort of confirm to me the Holy Spirit uh, sort of witnesses to me, tells me that this is the truth. And so even in the face of your propositional evidence, that doesn't really move me. How do you respond to that? Yeah, that, that's, that's actually one of, the, one of the objections I deal with in, in the article. Um, I, I find it I find it a dubious kind of a line to take, but a kind of a line that if someone is committed to taking it, there's really not a whole lot you can say to the person either. Um, uh, it, it's 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 kind of like kind of like the idea that um, you know Plantinga uh, says something similar with respect to believing in Jesus and believing in the resurrection, things like that. You know, you, so so someone uh, reads a Bible who does not have any kind of critical historical training, they find themselves believing it. Uh, even someone who is well educated, you know, could read the Bible and find themselves believing Jesus is the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. So, so you got this kind of, you know, basic experiential kind of uh, component uh, that, that that moves you to affirm that that moves you to affirm the belief. Now, the question is, uh, Plantinga says, well, look, there there are these uh, there are these defeaters. You can have these experiences that defeat what seems to you to be the case, right? And so, suppose you've got just really powerful evidence, let's say, that the resurrection didn't happen. Well, the question is, I mean, you know, can, can your experience uh, simply outflank that and outweigh that, or could the defeater carry sufficient weight? And again, I think when you look at the actual, again, I, I, I feel the fact that the, the, the critical Roman Catholic history. Notice what he's going to do here. He doesn't offer rebutting evidence, rebutting defeaters, or undercutting defeaters. Really, he's just offering what some Catholic scholars hold to a particular development of the episcopacy. And he's riding that train home uh, as, as much as he can. But if you sit in before the, the Lord and the sacrament, of, and if you're in an adoration chapel praying for the Blessed Sacrament, and you come to be convinced that Jesus is present in that Eucharistic host and is calling you to be a part of his church, who could defeat that? Uh, I mean, I think there. Are, I know I don't. I don't believe this works for everything. I don't think it's totally indefeatable. I think people who read the Book of Mormon for example, and feel a burning in the bosom to be Mormon, uh, I would say, look, that experience you have, I think it can be defeated. I would say your, the Book of Mormon, for example, uh, like if you're going to appeal to scholarship, I would say, look, you take a Bible. I don't want to get too off track here of Mormonism, but just bear with me. Uh, 
you take a Bible and you give it to Catholic, Jewish, atheist scholars, give it to scholars, religious, non-religious. They can basically tell you where the stuff allegedly happened in the books. They may not agree that it actually happened, but they can basically tell you which parts of the world this is going on in. Mormon scholars can't even do that with the Book of Mormon. There are different views. Some people say it all took place in Central America. Some people say the Book of Mormon takes place in North and South America. Some people say it all takes place around the Great Lakes or in the heartlands of America. Can't even, can't even agree on the basic location of where the story takes place in the Book of Mormon across two continents. To me, that and other evidence like it is strong rebutting defeaters against the Mormon burning in the bosom you might have reading the Book of Mormon. Now, for Jerry Wall's example, if you sit in the Adoration Chapel and you are there praying and you feel called to be Catholic, I do not think he has offered anything comparable against the claims of the doctrine of the papacy, uh, either in this video interview or in the article that he published with, I think, his Journal of Biblical and, and Theological Studies. Historians themselves. This is the position they themselves take on this. I think it's really difficult to appeal to some kind of experience to outweigh this kind of objective evidence. And uh, I think that poses a serious defeater for someone who wants to hold to Roman, Roman papal doctrine. I think they need more than to say, well, yeah, I read my Bible. When I read my Bible, it seems to me that Jesus, you know, is making Peter the Pope. And uh, that settles it for me. In just a couple weeks, I will be interviewing Bishop Robert Barron. He'll be on Capturing Christianity for the first time. It's going to be amazing. I have this interview linked in the description already. So if you're watching this in the future, when I've already done my interview with him, you can just click the link and go there immediately. But if you're watching this live, then it's still uh, we're still a couple weeks out. But you can nevertheless follow the link, turn on notifications, so that you can get a, a notification when we do go live. That's on September 22nd, 2020. Just wanted to yeah, let you know Catholic, that's coming up. Do what? He's a Roman Catholic, isn't he? Oh, yeah, he's bishop. He's a, he's a big guy. He's a, he's a big one. All right, let's get to some questions. This one is from Benjamin Hedelman, Handelman. Uh, thank you for sending this as a super chat. He says, appreciate calling it a family dispute. Very tired of being told I'm not a Christian because I'm Catholic. Well, I would just say to that, you are certainly my brother, and uh, I would welcome you to communion at my church, and I wish you could do the same. Well, I would say that all, <clears throat> all Christians, anyone who has been validly baptized, <clears throat> excuse me, does have communion with Christ's church, with the Catholic church, though in an imperfect way. Here's what the Catechism says. Catechism says, The church knows that she is joined in many ways to the baptized who are honored by the name of Christian, but do not profess the Catholic faith in its entirety, or have not preserved unity or communion under the successor of Peter. Those who believe in Christ and have been properly baptized are put in a certain, although imperfect, communion with the Catholic church. With the Orthodox churches, who've maintained valid holy orders, apostolic succession, this communion is so profound that it lacks little to attain the fullness that would permit a common celebration of the Lord's Eucharist. And so that's important. Someone like Jerry Walls will say, well, why can't I have communion with you? If you came to my church, you could receive the Lord's Supper. Why, why couldn't I receive the Lord's Supper at your church? Well, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says that those who... Re who eat and drink without discerning the body and blood of the Lord, or guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That uh, to receive the Eucharist, if you were to receive it, Jerry, at our church, without fully understanding uh, that this is uh, truly, uh, that Christ is truly present, substantially present, his body and blood are present, without discerning that, uh, would be would involve uh, some serious consequences. It would be a very serious matter. Also, when we receive communion, when we receive the Eucharist, that communion, we express also that we are in communion with Christ's Church, not just in belief in the Eucharist, but believing that which the Catholic Church obliges us to accept as matters pertaining to faith and morals. So receiving the Eucharist, if you were to come and a Protestant came to receive in the Catholic Church, we, we don't really have that communion yet because we're divided on important issues, even though through the bonds of baptism, we are united as Christians, and so Protestants uh, do share an imperfect communion uh, with Christ's Church. Another point I would bring up is this, that the question, are Catholics Christians? It's interesting that Protestants will defend sola scriptura, yet Protestants cannot, they'll say, well, we have sola scriptura, and we agree on the main things. The main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. That Protestants, and Jerry Walls has said this, I've critiqued this in previous articles, Walls has said, well, Protestants, we agree on the essentials, and that's what matters. Well, how about this? Jerry, there are other Protestant apologists. Uh, James White would be an example of this, and there are many others. 
that I've engaged who say that Catholics are not Christians. They say you're not. We they say we are not Christians because we trust in other things to save us, like the Mass, for example. So are Catholics Christians? Protestants do not agree on that point. The question who is and who is not a Christian that is essential, right? That is a main thing. Yet Scripture does not provide an explicit framework for saying who is Christian and who is not. So I think that is a kind of a shortcoming under the Protestant view of sola scriptura and the perspicuity or, or clearness of Scripture without the need of a teaching body that has Christ's authority, allegedly. All right, here's, uh, here's our next question from Jonathan H. He says, how much a influence or a role did Scottish common sense realism have on the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture in the USA and beyond? Well, I'm not a historian, but I have uh, I have read from a number of people who have alleged that it had considerable uh, considerable uh, influence in that regard. Um, um, common sense realist philosophy did tend to take things, uh, you know, uh, in a way that was straightforward. And I think there's something actually biblically and theologically grounded about that. I mean, uh, if, if we think the Bible is the word of God, uh, that God intends to communicate with us, I don't think it should surprise us at all if the fundamental message of Scripture is reasonably accessible. I'd say that's just not what Scripture teaches. Second Peter 3.16 says Paul's letters are confusing. People twist them to their own destruction. Acts chapter 8, when the Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah 53, he doesn't know what it's referring to. He needs Philip the evangelist to come and tell him. He's, Philip even asks him in Acts 8, oh, what is it, 8.30 through 31, I think around there. He says, Philip asks him, do you understand what you're reading? And the, the eunuch says, no, how can I unless someone shows me? So once again, this idea of the perspicuity of Scripture uh, is it's not it's certainly not not taught by scripture and the divisions among Protestants as I showed in the answer to the previous question is is quite evidence of of that fact. So I just want to apologize one last time for all of this crazy thunder that's happening behind me. You guys are probably hearing some of it come through on the audio. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to this stuff, so I apologize. All right, here's our next question from Cranman Photo Cinema. He's our videographer. He says, regarding 2 Timothy 3.17, how do you answer the Catholic claim that this refers to material sufficiency, not formal sh sufficiency? Uh, I don't know what 2 Timothy 3.17 says. Um, so let me look that up and see if I have any thoughts on that. I mean, I have any thoughts on that. But I'll take a look at it and see. This is a tad odd. I mean... I don't have every Bible verse memorized. I mean, you know, Tim Staples puts me to shame when it comes to that, but I would think someone who is engaging in the Catholic-Protestant dispute would have under his fingertips the main Bible verse that is cited in defense of the main doctrine of Protestantism, which is sola scriptura. That would be—I mean, that would be like asking me, like, what does Matthew—Catholic uh, apologist, what do you think of Matthew 16, 18? I said, well, I'm not, I'm not sure what that means. I didn't realize it deals with— you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. It's, it's interesting. That's all good. Do you have a Bible there with you? I do have a Bible. I've got, I've got several of them. I'm a Protestant for crying out loud. Of course. You read your Bible. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> yeah, all right. Let's see. Second, Second Timothy. Yeah, Second Timothy 3.17. I don't have it pulled up either. Otherwise, I would just read it for you. Second Timothy 3.17. Okay. Second Timothy 3.17 says this. Um... But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it, so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Yeah, I think that's the wrong reference. I think you might be talking about 1 Timothy 3, well, 2 Timothy 3.16. Come on, John. Read the, read the verse before that one. I'm going to uh, look it up on my Tim phone. 2 Timothy... Oh, no, wait a minute. I, I read the wrong verse. Okay. I think he's he's reading uh, 2 Timothy 4.17, but I'm, I'm not going to follow. <laughs> it's funny, actually, when I try to remember Bible verses, uh, this is a funny thing that happens to me. A lot of times I get the wrong verse because something happens in my mind, I will transpose numbers. Often when I cite Bible verses, it's a weird tick that I have. I'll switch the, the numbers around, things like that. So now he'll get to 2 Timothy 3.17. So 2 Timothy 3.17 says, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient and equipped for every good work. I take it that it is a reference to 3.16. 3.16 and so, 17 yes, probably, that's yeah. What I know. All scripture is inspired by God, is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Um, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every work. Let me see if I can actually put this on the screen so you guys can see. I don't know if it's going to 
No, nah, it's not going to work. All right. Well, I'll, have that, I'll have that ready next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's fascinating. Right before that, it says, but how from childhood you have known the sacred writings that are able to instruct you through faith in Christ Jesus. So from his childhood, he knew this. Now, what's striking is who his teachers are said to be. And it's his mother, Lois, and his grandmother, Eunice, or vice versa. I can't remember which. They are the ones who taught him this. So he was simply instructed by two women, by the way, uh, with respect to the scriptures. And uh, from childhood, he knew the sacred writings that were able to instruct him for salvation through faith in Jesus. So I think that's uh, that's actually a good verse for the Protestant side, actually. Well, it's kind of the only verse Protestants rely on. I'm, I'm not sure what Jerry was gathering from that. Uh, very brief interaction with 2 Timothy 3.17. Go check out my videos where I, I've engaged other apologists on this verse. I have a big section on it in my book, The Case for Catholicism. Paul is not teaching that Scripture alone is sufficient, all we need. Uh, that's not what he's teaching from the verse. The, the Scriptures that are being referred to are the Old Testament Scriptures that will teach Timothy how to be wise, how to be prudent, how to be filled with virtue— uh, that will enable him to continue on the Christian path, but Paul never says that the only thing a believer needs uh, is Scripture. That's eisegesis, that's reading into the text instead of reading out of the text uh, what it's actually saying. Okay, let's get to another question here uh, from Hercule, Hercule Flam Flambeau. He says, Call to Communion, the Bishop of History article addresses this argument. Have you heard of that article? No, Call I to Communion, the Bishop of History. That's the name of the, the person who wrote the comment. Okay, so what, I guess I'm not clear what he's saying. Uh, it's okay. He's referencing an article he, he says that addresses the argument. Uh, but if you've not heard of it, that's fine. We can just move on. Yeah. All right. Well, here's what it's interesting about this. So the questioner, I believe, is referring to this article here on Called to Communion, which is an excellent website, by the way, uh, where people dialogues, a lot of essays, mostly written by Catholics, some by Protestants. Usually it's about touch points between Reformed theology and Catholic theology. And so Brian Cross wrote an article here, The Bishops of History and the Catholic Faith, A Reply to Brandon Addison. Now what's interesting here is that in uh, Jerry Walls's article where he expounds on this argument in the Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies, there's a footnote in there where he cites Addison's essay on called the Communion. So what's interesting is that Walls is familiar with Addison's original essay, but I don't know if he's familiar with this reply to the essay you can find at Called to Communion, which is another excellent resource and website if you want more information on Catholic-Protestant interactions and other things like that. So, Here's the next one from Jay Shai. He says, quote, That's false. Read Clement on Rome, letter to Corinthians written in the first century. He knew the apostles and said they ordained bishops to take their spots. Well, uh, again, uh, why don't we have any evidence of this? I mean, uh, you know, why, why is it not until late second century that we have anything like uh, a monarchical bishop emerging? Um, I, 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 think, uh, I think you've got a, a dubious reading of the patristic claim, but even more, I think the, the historical evidence does not support the claim that it was read in that way by, by the early church. Um, yeah, historical evidence does not support the claim that it was read in that way by by the early church. Um, yeah. All right, so... Well, I'll let you just read the passage for yourself. Go read Clement and the other Apostolic Fathers. Uh, you can see here that, that Clement speaks very clearly that the Apostles knew through our Lord Jesus Christ there would be strife on account of the office of the Episcopate or Bishop. So he's talking about this, the office of the Episcopate in the, in the first century. For this reason, as they had obtained perfect foreknowledge, they appointed already those ministers already mentioned and gave them instructions that when these should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. So I think that the doctrine of apostolic succession is very strong when you read Clement uh, and when you read the other apostolic fathers. Uh, when you have, uh, when Dr. Walls is talking about the Episcopate and saying, well, it's not around till the mid second century, I think maybe he's talking about in Rome, but St. Ignatius is very clear. He talks about obeying the bishop, it's around 108 AD, and he doesn't speak about it as if it's some kind of novelty. It's just assumed you're not a real church unless you have a bishop, and that you're to obey your bishop. And it's not. he doesn't speak of it as it's something that just appeared a few years earlier, but this was a, a time-honored, well-worn part of the hierarchical structure of the Christian church. All right, so here is uh, another comment from Jay Shy. He says, Plead, please Dante Trenthorn, Dante Trenthorn? He wrote articles refuting your arguments. I would love to see Cameron host a debate with Trent. 
I'm actually in conversation with Trent. He's about to have a baby. He's, uh, I think, his third child. And so after... And as of this recording, baby was already born. Mom and baby doing doing just fine. After he get, gets back on his feet and they get things under control again, which I know how stressful it can be to have a new baby in the house. Uh, when, when he's back on his feet and ready to start doing interviews and do debates and everything, it, we're actually planning something right now for the beginning of December. So it's a long ways away right now from where we are. Not, not too long, a, few, a couple months. But Trent Horn will be on Capturing Christianity at yeah, some well, point. Again, so. I mean Oh, and also, I'm rearing to go. I want to get on the show here to offer my my counterpoint here to Dr. Walls. So that's why I actually emailed uh, Cameron and I said, hey, things are not as, uh, you know, calamitous as I thought at the house and things are going really well. So I was looking at my schedule based on the paternity leave time I would be taking. Uh, I moved it up to October, actually. I said, let's do October. I think tentatively October 20th. Uh, I'd love to come on and do a counterpoint to what Dr. Walls presented, what I call the strongest argument uh, against Protestantism. So, but now <laughs> this is a, this is the, what's funny is actually when people sent me this video, you know, what is really providential. They sent me this video, like, Trent, can you do a rebuttal to this? I'm like, sure. So I just randomly skipped ahead in the video just to see what it was. I didn't want to start at the beginning. I just jumped ahead and I jumped ahead to this very question about me. <laughs> And so I thought, oh, wow, this is this is funny that I've that I've shown up here. And well, I'll let you hear Dr. Walls's answer and I'll give you my reply. I, I would just say this. I mean, um, um, what I find striking about this comment is the reliance on a popular apologist over against a world class historian who's a Roman Catholic who was on the, you know, the Pontifical Historical Commission. I find it striking the reliance upon upon popular apologists rather than on serious scholarship. Um, and again, I think that's very telling. In fact, I, I, I think I think a lot of Roman Catholics are sort of like um, young earth creationists. Um, you know that they, they've got their they've got their young earth creationists who say the world's only ten thousand years old, and uh, here, here's the evidence for it. And uh, they follow those people rather than the leading scientists in the world. Um, that's what I think. That's what I think is striking, and that's why uh, in this discussion today, I cited people who are authorities in papal history. These are not popular apologists; they're they're they're, they're papal authorities, and uh, um, you can, I guess, follow whoever you think, you know, makes the most sense. But um, uh, I think it's I think it's striking that um, that uh, you know these leading historians themselves are the ones who make this case. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if Dr. Walls is really familiar with my work. Uh, if he is familiar with my work, then I would infer from this answer that he doesn't consider it to be serious scholarship, that it's on par with young earth creationism. Uh, I don't know what it takes to be a serious scholar. I do have three master's degrees, uh, and I've written nine going on 10 books now. Uh, they've been well received, but I've also published in peer-reviewed academic journals. So... So I don't know, maybe he means that, or it's quite possible Jerry Walls has never read my work, and he just assumes that my defense of the Catholic faith is similar maybe to other Catholic, popular Catholic apologetics that he has come across, uh, which is not a wise assumption to make. Uh, but I would enjoy interacting with him. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, do a debate with him on the papacy if he is interested in doing that. Maybe we could set that up either on Cameron's channel or on Matt Frad's channel, Pints of Aquinas, we'll, we'll have to see about that. But this analogy about young earth creationism, this idea that my work as a Catholic apologist, I'm like the young earth creationist, and the Catholic historians are the real scholars, and they say that the papacy is false, which they don't, which ad nauseum, they don't. They just put forward another formulation of the doctrine, one that I would agree with when it comes to the gradual development of the episcopacy by the way. So here's the analogy I want to make that I think uh, is very appropriate here between uh, creationism and this debate about the papacy. So let's take with creationism, we would have three groups. We would have the young earth creationists who say, yeah, I know the Bible contradicts the scientific evidence that the earth is billions of years old, but guess what? The scientific evidence is wrong and the Bible uh, is right, is what the young earth creationists would say. 
Uh, then you have the theistic evolutionists, and Dr. Walls is one of these people. And he would say, well, no, it's only a certain reading of the Bible that contradicts the scientific evidence. You can have the scientific evidence that the Earth is billions of years old, uh, and if you read the Bible in a particular way to see that it's not necessarily affirming as obligatory for Christian belief that the Earth is only thousands of years old, if you look at it in that way, which Dr. Walls does as a theistic evolutionist, then there's no contradiction. Then you have the atheists who would come along and say, like the young earth creationists, they'd say the Bible contradicts the scientific evidence, but guess what? It's not the scientific evidence that's wrong, it's the Bible that's wrong. And the atheists a lot of times will say to the theistic evolutionists like Dr. Walls, Dr. Walls, you're just interpreting the Bible to save your belief, and you're just doing that to try to get out of a jam, and you know it, and you're dishonest, or you're poor scholarship, yada yada. And I'm sure Dr. Walls as a theistic evolutionist would not enjoy being told that, because he would probably say, no, I'm not. There are good reasons to believe the Bible is not literally affirming a six-day creation or thousand-year-old creation. And actually, there were uh, church fathers, like Augustine, for example, who would hold uh, Dr. Walls's view. I'm sure he would go down that line when dealing with the atheists, and he would tell the atheists, hey, I'm the Christian here. I'll tell you, I can tell you, here's what the Bible says, and don't tag me over here, I can read both these things, the scientific evidence and what the Bible says, and there's harmony here, and you're trying to find a contradiction where one doesn't exist. So that's the analogy. Young Earth creationists, theistic evolutionists, and atheists. When it comes to the papacy, each of these three groups has a counterpart. The counterpart to the Young Earth creationist would be the zealous Catholic apologist. They would say, yeah, Vatican I contradicts the historical evidence, but the historical evidence is wrong. And I, there was all of this, uh, everything taught about the papacy, and they, they put forward this kind of grand hypothesis uh, in spite of what the historical evidence may say. Then there would be the cautious Catholic apologists who would be analogous to the theistic evolutionists, who would say, no, only a certain reading of Vatican I contradicts the historical evidence. When you read Vatican I and understand properly what is being infallibly taught and what is not being infallibly taught and what is being asserted in different ways, you can see that Vatican I does not assert as grand a hypothesis as a more zealous Catholic apologist, who's like the young earth creationist Walls is talking about, uh, puts forward. So the cautious Catholic apologist like myself would say, well, only a certain reading of the First Vatican Council contradicts historical evidence. There's actually no contradiction there when you look at the historical evidence and the magisterial documents when you interpret them in the proper light. But then you have Protestant apologists who are analogous to the atheists. Uh, so just as the atheist comes along and says the Bible and science contradict, but guess what? It's the Bible that's wrong. The Protestant apologists will come along and say, Vatican I contradicts historical evidence, but guess what? It's Vatican I that's wrong about this, and the Church is in error when it teaches the doctrine of the papacy. So that's what's so frustrating when I see Dr. Walls doing this, that in this approach here, as a Protestant apologist, he is acting like the atheists that I'm sure he doesn't enjoy dealing with, who try to say that he doesn't understand the Bible or he doesn't understand scholarship. So I would just implore someone like Dr. Walls or other people who hold, who hold his view, don't act like uh, the atheists. Don't act like the atheists who say there's a contradiction, so definitely it's, it's flat out wrong. Instead, if you are willing, especially if you were a theistic evolutionist or, 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 or someone like that uh, on the Protestant side, sorry, let me bring this up here. Uh, if you can say, look, the scientific evidence for the past and the biblical evidence, what the Bible teaches, are not, they may appear contradictory to some people, but when you study scripture and see what it's teaching, you see there's no contradiction, and there were even older church fathers like Augustine who held to this view, so it's not a view we just came up with to save the Bible 150 years ago when Darwin was around. If Dr. Walls is willing to say that for the Bible and the doctrine of creation, then he should give Catholic apologists the same flexibility to say, look, we can read Vatican I and the historical evidence on the papacy to show there is no contradiction here. Uh, also, this is not a view we came up with 150 years ago to get around historical studies of the papacy, because as I showed in my citation of Ludwig Ott and how he cites St. Jerome, the gradual development of the episcopacy was something that was known by the early church fathers or speculated by some of the early church fathers. So there's no contradiction. So really, uh, when it comes to being, I, I am not the young earth creationist here. I'm more like Dr. Walls. I'm the like the theistic evolutionist, the more cautious uh, Catholic apologist. And ironically, Dr. Walls, in the approach he takes, he is being like the atheist critics uh, that approach the text in a very rigid way, seeking uh, 
contradictions instead of trying to seek understanding. And I, and I would just implore him and others in that particular camp to not, uh, to not operate uh, in that way. All right, let's get to another question here from Barely Protestant. It's an interesting YouTube name. He says, if he or she, if you look at the seven ecumenical councils, you continually see the Roman bishops being in submission to them, yet Vatican I does not allow for this to be true. It claims that no ecumenical council can be over a pope. Any thoughts um, on that? I think I agree with it. <laughs> All uh, right. Ex except for the claim that no ecumenical council can be over a pope. I mean... Uh, the, the, the seven ecumenical councils, and again, you know, you're, you're talking about issues in, in historical theology. I'm a philosopher, you know, I don't, uh, I don't claim to be an expert in all these historical issues, but um, you continue to see the Roman bishops in submission, yet Vatican I does not allow this. It claims no ecumenical council can be over a pope. I guess I would agree with um, the ecumenical councils rather than Vatican I, given the choice. All right, here's a, here's a good Okay, except we have a problem here, and there's lots we could say about the ecumenical councils and the popes, but I'll give you the problem of the robber councils. So there are seven ecumenical councils, but there's other councils that try to claim their councils, but they're not. One would be the second council of Ephesus that was later declared a robber council and was repudiated at the Council of Chalcedon. So you had, you had first Ephesus, then you had second Ephesus, which was held, I think, just about two years before the Council of Chalcedon. And actually, there were more bishops present at the second council of Ephesus. I think it was trying to usher in the Monophysite heresy. Uh, but the reason that later even the Eastern Orthodox don't recognize this council was because the Pope did not give the council his approval. The papal legat did not give it uh, papal approval. So in order to distinguish genuine ecumenical councils from the non-genuine ones, you have to look actually at the history uh, to see the Pope's interaction uh, with these councils. So if you want more on that, you should definitely check out uh, Shameless Popery. Is a website by my friend Joe Heschmeyer. He has a great book called Pope Peter. So if you want more on the papacy, uh, check out Joe's book, Pope Peter, offered at shop.catholic.com. So not a shameless plug. That's just that's just where it is, and it's it's uh, appropriate for what we're what we're discussing here. Good question from the Jason909. He says, Dr. Walls, you just said I'm not a historian. So my question is, why should we believe you after making such an admission? <laughs> well, because I have read historians. I have read historians. Uh, that's that's the point, and um, uh, uh, that seems to be the consensus among the leading Roman Catholic historians. Um, I have asked a number of people. I've, I've done research in terms of trying to, to track down what the consensus is, and this bishop, this book of Duffy's, it's uh, gosh, it just came out in a uh, a new edition. Uh, it's come out, you know, several several new editions, and um, it is considered an authoritative history of the popes. So. Remind um, me, is Duff, Duffy is Catholic? Duff, Duffy is a Catholic. Yes, he, he was. On how the, does he? He was. So on how the do you think that he was on the Pope's historical commission? How uh, how do you think that he responds to this type of argument? How do I think he responds to it? Uh, he doesn't think the the traditional papal claims have to be true. Um, uh, he, he thinks that he thinks that so long as it was gradually gradually revealed um, and the like, that that's all you need. So. Um, the claims of Vatican I, which he seems pretty obvious to show are not, are not in fact objectively true, um, doesn't seem to bother him, as I can, so far as I can tell. Well, so walk me through that again. Is, that, is, that, is he basically saying the argument that I gave earlier, that this is a kind of thing that develops over time, these doctrines? Yes, that, 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 is, that is the line he takes, yeah. yeah so, and so you don't think that that's an acceptable route to, do, to go, though, right? No, I don't think it's an acceptable route to go. I mean, yeah, he thinks that he, some, he thinks that sometime... Uh, in the late second century, one of the Roman one of the Roman uh, leaders became the first clerkat bishop. At that point, yeah, I was actually noticing in the comments someone said that basically the same thing, that the papal the doctrine of the papacy is something that developed over time. It wasn't like it means something different later on than it did back then. So you didn't necessarily. I guess that means you didn't necessarily have to have papal succession. I no, the doc the doctrine that developed would be the role of Peter's successor in being the Bishop of Rome, to understand that. The fact that Peter's successor is the Bishop of Rome, that is not uh, an essential element. It's a dogmatic fact, uh, so it's essential in its contingent historical reality, uh, but it but it wouldn't be the case that if you it was impo if it was an, it would not be the case that if it were impossible to be bishop of Rome, Peter would no longer have a successor. That's not the case because, like I said, Rome could be 
you know, what if what if in an alternative universe, Rome had been captured by Muslim conquerors and the Bishop of Rome could not preside there? Or what if in the future now, Rome is destroyed in some kind of nuclear war or attack or something? What was that Mission Impossible movie? Uh, Fallout? I think that was it. Or Ghost Pro... No, F- Fallout, yeah. Where th- at the beginning of the movie, they fake that there was a bomb that goes off in Jerusalem, Rome, and Mecca, all, all at the three bomb nuclear bombs go off. You-, you get the idea here. No, that it develops that it's always the case that Peter had successors. But how those successors exercise their office, that is something that, that can develop. And so that's what Duffy and the others are, are, are getting at here and this questioner is getting at. I don't know. I don't know what that uh, even means. But, but, yeah, but, that, that's, that's exactly right. But... But uh, again, again, if you take Vatican I seriously, it is at odds with what these people are saying uh, w- with respect to their revised understanding of papal history. That's the point that seems to me to be really important. And so remember, let's continue the analogy that I made earlier when we're talking about creationism here, what Dr. Walls is doing. What he is doing here is he's acting like how atheists would treat him. What he is doing is like if an atheist said, you know what, guys, uh, Christianity's false, because I got this book by uh, Ken Miller and Francis Collins, and here are Christians who will tell you that evolution is true and a literal interpretation of Genesis is false. These are Christians. These are the This isn't an atheist. It's a Christian. Uh, you know, Ken Miller, uh, Francis Collins, I'm sure you could— uh, put, put other names uh, in there who would, who would hold to that view and, and argue against. There's a book, I think, called Deliver Us from Evolution, quotation mark, was a, a recent Protestant entry into the list. And an atheist would say, see, the Christians say this. And then someone asked them, well, how are they still Christians? Do they believe this? And the, the atheist says, well, they think that life can develop gradually, but that they're not taking the Bible seriously. They're not really taking the Bible seriously if they accept evolution. So it whole, the whole thing falls apart. Once again, what Dr. Walls is doing is he's acting like these guys. When, if he acts this way when it comes to uh, the doctrine of creation, I would just ask that he give this alternative parallel view on another doctrine uh, equal consideration and just just be able to do that. It's not not that hard of a request. All right, let's move on. Here's Here's a question from Matt Boyer. He says, quote, What are your thoughts on the Eucharist with the symbolic view still being in its infancy? And then someone said, "Great shirt, Cam. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'm a huge Marvel fan." Uh, what are what are my thoughts on the Eucharist? Um, and I'm not sure what he means with the symbolic view still being in its infancy. I mean, I I, I believe that. Um, that he, I guess uh, he mean, he means that the metaphorical view of the of the Eucharist is only 500 years old, right, whereas right. the the real body view is goes all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, I I'm in a, I attend an Episcopal church, and uh, I think the Episcopal church has a, a balanced uh, view on this that takes that takes the Eucharist very seriously. That uh, it's the body and blood of Christ, um, but it is not uh, it is not uh, the body and blood of Christ by virtue of the fact that it's been miraculously transformed into such. But but we indeed uh, feed on Christ and uh, experience His strength and experience His blessing and empowerment when we take the Eucharist and believe it accordingly. Yeah, I just wanted to say on on the. Yeah, so that seems like kind of a conduit view. I think that's similar to what Calvin described his view of the Eucharist. It's certainly far from Luther's view of the Eucharist, of consubstantiation. It's somewhere between Calvin's view and Zwingli's view, which would be the memorial or the or the symbolic view. Uh, but I would say that those views, memorial, symbolic, or even the conduit view, they really are only 500 years old. And, and Dr. Walls hasn't really answered the question as to why we should give track to this when for 1500 years the church did not accept this view of the eucharist that's i mean that's what's moving francis chan for example closer to eastern orthodoxy last time i checked and i did a video about this you can check on the channel uh dealing with uh francis chan the eucharist church history and what james white had to say about it so check that out in the in the channel uh video feed this topic of the eucharist i debated matt frad on this topic specifically on the eucharist so i don't have all of the details still in my mind so i can't i can't say everything about it uh, so what I'll do instead is just say if you'd like to watch that debate that I did with Matt Frad on the Eucharist, then head over to patreon.com slash capturing Christianity. He and I are doing these debates in order to basically grow our channels and grow our reach. So uh, go do that if you'd like to see that debate. All right, uh, let's get on to the next question. I think Jay Shy just sent in another question, uh, but we have one before that. So Roger Marshall, 
He says, how do you respond to the argument that we would not have the Bible, but for the prior existence of a church tra tra tradition, can't, why can't I say that word, that canonized it? Yeah, I don't have any problem at all with that. I mean, I, I think it, that God inspired in... All right, a minute. Wait a minute here. Now watch with Dr. Walls' answer that he has a, skepti a snug skeptical hat on when it comes to the claim of the papacy, that God chose Peter to have his authority and Peter's successors to have authority, and if you can't give me evidence of that in the first century, that's just obvious to corroborate that claim, then it's not good enough. But Dr. Walls believes that God, Christ's authority was given in, success, in perpetuity for the Church, for the Church's benefit, to a particular set of writings, 27-book canon of the New Testament. So if the authority is given to Peter and successors, if I don't have specific evidence in the first century, not good enough. It goes to these writings— then we'll see what what then listen to what evidence suffices for Dr. Walls. Inspiring the Bible uh, had a long range kind of a process in mind. Uh, the, the church was able to discern it. He gave the church discernment and recognizing. It. I mean, it would make it would make little sense for God to inspire the Bible and then not give the church discernment and understanding to to recognize it uh, when it's there. And uh, you know, the, the case has been made very very effectively. Um, that that the Bible was essentially recognized before it was officially canonized. And then the canon, the canonical list that was official, gosh, I think that happened like around 400, like that. It wasn't until the, it wasn't until... Um, End of the 4th century, before the year 400. After the Reformation, I think, that the Roman Catholics uh, first laid out their official list of, uh, of, the, of the New Testament uh, documents. So... Um, it wasn't until the Council of Trent that the canon was solemnly defined in an infallible way at an ecumenical council, because Protestants were throwing out the deuterocanonical books. But prior to that point, uh, these regional councils, the Council of Hippo and Carthage, and then the teachings of Pope Damasus uh, at the end of the 4th century, really quelled controversies over the canon after that point, which there were controversies uh, before that. It was not essentially recognized. There was a lot of dispute over especially particular books like Revelation, uh, the letters of John, Hebrews, for example, even James. James was still disputed. Even Martin Luther wanted to put James in a special part of the Bible because uh, he was not happy with what it said about faith and works. The, these, these documents were affirmed. Uh, I think if God is going to inspire the Bible, it's part of uh, the process. It would also lead the church to discern and recognize it. And I think you see the church discerning and recognize it over here a period of uh, a couple hundred years in various councils and the like until a consensus is reached. So I don't see anything problematic about that at all. Well, yeah, it is problematic when how do you know that this canon are the how do you know these books are inspired and it's these particular books that are inspired? How do you know that? It seems to be that. Dr. Walls has knowledge they're inspired apart from the Church's recognition. Now, a lot of Protestant apologists will straw man the Catholic position here to say that Catholics say that the Church uh, defined uh, which books are inspired, as if we decided, the Catholic Church decided what's inspired, when it's God that decides that when he inspires the text. And I agree with that. The Church did not uh, decide or define what books are inspired. The Church doesn't decide it. So imagine three things. There's the false view the Church decides it, but there'd be the Protestant view that Dr. Wallace seems to be endorsing and others, that the Church merely discovered the canon. We, the early Church, lowercase c, came upon it, and that's great, but it's not necessary for having an infallible grounding on this teaching. Uh, the Church doesn't define or decide what books are inspired. God decides what's inspired. But the Church doesn't discover what is inspired either, haplessly. Rather, the Church maintains a sacred tradition, and the Church has the authority to officially declare, does not decide, does not discover, it declares what is inspired. And that gives us firm grounding for knowing uh, what, which human writings are indeed Scripture. If you don't have that, all you have is just basically Dr. Wall's assumption this is Scripture— and we would expect if it is scripture, the church would eventually discover it, and then they did, so there we go. Imagine if I made that argument for the papacy. Well, if God chose to give us a papacy, we would expect people to recognize that there was a pope, and early 2nd century is still pretty early. It's way before the, the, the canon and the end of the 4th century. Therefore, uh, there was a papacy. Dr. Walls would never be okay with that argument for the papacy, yet he accepts a very similar argument for the inspiration of scripture from a Protestant perspective. Once again, apply the same standards of evidence evenly, no matter who is making the claim.
All right, here's another question from Harry Callahan. Instead of debating each other, and this is kind of off topic, it says, instead of debating each other, we need intellectually honest and informed discourse to edify one another. Debating just leads to conflict and resentment. What do you think about that comment? Well, I think it can, but I think it doesn't need to. And I think if, if both sides of the, uh, of the debate are concerned with the truth and advancing the truth and advancing what they think is the biblical perspective and the Christian perspective for the sake of, the, uh, of, of edifying the body of Christ, then I, I see nothing, not only do I see nothing wrong with it, but I see a lot right about it. So uh, the apostles certainly engaged in debate and argument and dispute, and that was, that was going on in the church from the word go when they formulated the councils. And uh, they thought getting God's truth right and getting it accurate and understanding it correctly was extremely important. And they invested a lot uh, in making that happen. So I think we're simply following in their steps when we try to do the same. So let me ask you a question based on something that I just saw in the, the live chat. Um, and I would be happy to debate this topic and, and others. And I love people who have a spirit of, of debate, but it's civil. So I think that's great. I'm getting a whole lot out of this live chat tonight, today. Uh, so here, here's, here, here's a question. Some people that came to this stream might have been expecting like a knockdown argument to Catholicism. Yet what they received is a very nuanced argument about the papacy, the early, her early history of the papacy. And we have some evidence against Catholicism basically is what we kind of wound up at. So what do you say to someone like that who is expecting like this well, knockdown argument? I think, I, think it's, I think it's a very powerful argument. I mean, it may not be a knockdown argument because, you know, uh, as I say uh, in the article, I talk about various responses that, that, that Roman Catholics can make. And they could say, well, you know, there all that all that the doctrine claims is that there was a succession of bishops. It doesn't say they would be visible to history. It doesn't say that uh, everybody would would recognize all of them or anything like that. All it says is they were there, and we can believe they were there. So, but while I don't think it's it's an absolute knockdown drag out argument, I do think it is a very powerful argument. Uh, again, uh, not unlike it's got to be taken seriously. Not yeah. Again, not unlike the situation I think you would face if you find your if you found uh, a situation in which the leading scholars came to the conclusion that uh, the resurrection of Jesus did not really happen. I think you'd be faced with a really serious problem that you could not simply ignore. All right, here let's get on to some more questions from A M. And this is actually a friend of mine. His name is. Uh... Well, I don't know if he wants me to share his name. Anyways, he's a friend. He's a brother. He says, "Thanks for the opportunity. Please share the references." But citing scholars without providing their reasons can be weak or worst. Catholic scholars can be liberal and have access to grind just as anyone else. Well, uh, again, I don't think this is I don't think this is a matter of liberal Catholic scholarship. Um, this is a matter of something that is a matter of consensus among Roman Catholic historians, uh, Protestant historians, and Eastern Orthodox historians. So, uh, the, the Eastern Orthodox theologian, what's his name? Uh, Rachel Irenaeus, John Baird, John Baird, B-E-H-R. Uh, he shares he shares this view. For an example, someone he, he's a scholar of Irenaeus, uh, and again, Protestants share this view. So this is not a matter of liberal versus conservative. This is a matter of simply being honest with the historical evidence, and that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. I mean, it does not make you conservative to 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 be to be uh, blind to the historical objective evidence that is not a sign of conservatism that is a sign of dogmatism yeah i would say though it's not about conservative versus liberal it's more about skeptical and uh prudent or cautious that i believe we should approach evidence carefully it's a difference between uh carefulness or preciseness and skepticism some skepticism is is warranted but for me, I want to hear the arguments. And so far in this entire discourse, when you're talking about Duffy and Eno and the others, uh, you get these arguments from silence for the absence of a first century bishop of Rome. And honestly, I, I find them to be incredibly weak. And that's okay, because you know what? So what if there are, is a consensus among historians today? First, as I showed before, even with that consensus of the episcopacy developing gradually, that doesn't refute the doctrine of the papacy. But even still, I'm not convinced by a lot of these arguments, and I want to see what the argument has to say, uh, because there was a time in New Testament studies when the consensus of historians was against things like the virgin birth, against the inerrancy of Scripture. That's what gave rise to the fundamentalist Protestant movement of the early 20th century. So the scholars that exist today, they're only a thin slice of all the scholars that have ever existed. It's I think it was G.K. Chesterton who said, tradition is the democracy of the dead, and they need to get to have their vote too. So I think sometimes when we appeal to scholars, we sometimes leave out the democracy of the dead that Chesterton spoke about, 
uh, we, we should include them. It's important. Scholars and, and experts are helpful in navigating certain areas, but ultimately we should see where, where the evidence takes us. And so when Roman Catholic scholars themselves, again, have come to this conclusion, it is not a matter of their being liberal. It is simply a matter of their taking seriously the evidence and following it honestly and objectively. And, uh, you know, again, I, I cited that passage in Eno uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the presentation where he says such a view is becoming increasingly widespread. It was 1990, right? And so, so the word was getting out. The word was becoming recognized that this was a matter of consensus. And it's not a matter of liberalism, but it's a matter of honesty. I mean, uh, you, 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 are not, you are not showing yourself to be orthodox by being dogmatic in the face of contrary evidence. I don't think so. So I, I'm perfectly confident that orthodoxy is fully compatible with being rationally honest. I don't think you have to be rationally dishonest with the evidence in order to be orthodox. All right, but let's I'll get to another comment. Yeah. There's another comment or a question from Jay Shy, and he was the guy that was talking earlier about First Clement. He says, with all due respect, I just told you that this is a first century writing that shows bis bishops ordained read it. It's not second century. Letter to the Corinthians 42, 4 through 5. It was in 8080. And what, what is the claim he's making that's so important here? I guess I'm not following the claim. I might have to go back to his earlier comment. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Yeah, he made a comment about First Clement mentioning the bishops. Let me see if I can find it. I think it came after that. All right, here it is. I think I got it. He says, that's false. Read Clement on Rome, on Rome, letter to Corinthians written in the first century. He knew the apostles and said they ordained bishops to take their spots. He said they ordained bishops to take their spots. Well, again, mm -hmm. again, uh, uh, again, Roman Catholics themselves do not see this as evidence in favor of the Roman Catholic doctrine of Episcopacy. Um, uh, I, 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 I would have to look at that passage uh, to say more on, on it, but uh, I am not prepared to talk more about it now. All right, let's move on to... Uh, and I've already shown it to you twice, so that's enough. You, you get the picture. Uh, another question. And we have a, a bunch more to get to, so we'll get to as many as we can. All right, Jim Lamb. Thank you for your super chat, Jim. He says, without a divinely protected authority to adjudicate for the faithful what is orthodox and what is heterodox, every theological position is a matter of interpretive opinion. Dr. Walls, what say you? Uh, I say that when God revealed himself, uh, the church understood its essential meaning correctly. And in the early ecumenical councils, I think they basically got it right. So uh, in that regard, uh, the, 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 the essentials of the faith have been defined, they have been creedally specified, uh, and so on. Now, uh, I don't know what more we need than that, okay? So, so we've got the Trinity, we've got the Incarnation, you know, we, we've got the fundamental Christian doctrines that have been laid down and are matters of consensus and have been so for hundreds of years now. So what more, you know, I'm not sure what you mean when you talk about a divinely protected authority. Uh, I think you have that in terms of God guiding the early ecumenical councils on these critical critical doctrinal issues. I think they got the Christology right. I think they got Trinity right. I think they got all these matters right. So we've got the faith. The faith is there in those classic creeds and confessions. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure what more you need than that in order to have uh, the faith uh, accurately and, and carefully preserved. The problem with this, and this is this comes up in Dr. Wall's articles and a little bit in his book, and I guess a lot in his book, Roman but not Catholic, that with his uh, co-author. The idea here is he's saying, look, Protestants have just inherited the great tradition of the ecumenical councils of the early church. If you read the, the Nicene Constantinople Creed, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and the Apostles' Creed, I should say. You read these creeds, you get the essentials, Protestants have the essentials, what more do we need? Uh, well, if you believe, the problem is the creeds are not exhaustive. So the creeds don't have everything we believe, obviously, but not even everything that you would call essential. There are very important doctrines that are not found in creeds. For example, the creeds normally, they don't contain moral teachings. So what would I say to Dr. Walls? What about Protestants who say homosexual behavior is not sinful or that abortion is not sinful? Uh, this, these were things that were clearly universal in the early church. The wrongness of uh, abortion and contraception, I would say, and the wrongness of homosexual relations— uh, how would he address people like Matthew Vines, who are Protestant, who say, at least on homosexuality, oh, well, no, that's, that's, that's fine. Or the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice that say, oh, you can, you can be pro-choice and be Christian. Um, if Dr. Walls, and they tell Dr. Walls, this isn't, these aren't in the creeds, 
he'll have to say, well, yeah, but the early church who came up with the creeds, they believed these were wrong. What about also the doctrine of hell? Uh, Dr. Walls defends the traditional doctrine of hell as eternal conscious torment, uh, but that's not in the creeds. The creeds don't specify that about many things about the afterlife. Yet it was that was believed, uh, the vast majority of the early church fathers believed that. You might have found a few universalists here or there, but they were the very, very minority position on the matter. He had origin in his apocatastasis, for example, which was later condemned, by the way, at a regional council. Or was it an ecumenical council? I think it was, I think it was at a regional council. I think it was at the Council of Orange. It was, uh, it was condemned. So if, if he's trying to buy from this, if he tries to say, well, okay, it's not just what's in the creeds, it's also what the early church believed, well, then with the early church, if we're talking during these ecumenical councils in the uh, 4th, 5th, 6th centuries, then you also have to believe to be consistent, not just that, but in the sacrificial nature of the Mass, the true presence of the Eucharist, intercessory prayer, uh, the, the Marian doctrines, especially calling Mary Theotokos, which was the main sticking point of the Council of Ephesus. Uh, you know, the salvation cannot be lost. Uh, sorry, that salvation can be lost, I should say. The alternative view was not developed until Calvin in the 16th century. So it's really, this is really picking and choosing here, saying that Protestants, oh, well, we align up just with the ecumenical councils and their creeds, maybe with a very narrow reading of the creeds, but not with what the early church believed, that's for sure. And if you don't have a magisterial teaching authority, then the questioner is absolutely right. Then it's just my, my opinion uh, against yours, basically. All right, so another comment from Barely Protestant, and this is sort of clarifying something he said earlier about the Eucharist. Anglicans and Lutherans historically have and currently hold to the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and baptismal regeneration. So he just wanted to, to make an additional comment there. Thank you for your super chat, Barely. All right, here's another question. Carl Eric Tangen. Dr. Walls, would you reiterate your assertion that these papal claims are as important to Catholic teaching as the resurrection? Or did I misunderstand? <laughs> Okay, yeah, you did. Okay, so so my title is somewhat, somewhat misleading. I'm not saying that, that the papal doctrine is as important to Catholicism. I'm simply saying there's a parallel in the sense that uh, with respect to Orthodox Christianity as a whole, if, if, if resurrection isn't true, it has large implications for other Christian doctrines which are without more and without foundation and support. And in a similar way, I pointed out, the doctrine of papal authority has a similar role uh, in Roman Catholicism. I pointed out three distinct ways. I don't remember exactly what they were, but but the point of the matter is, uh, if if the papacy is shown to be false, it undermines distinctive claims to Roman Catholic authority uh, and the like. So I'm not saying it's as important as the resurrection. I'm saying there's certain parallels uh, between how uh, Orthodox theology stands or falls with the resurrection, and Catholic distinctives likewise stand or fall with papal authority. So if, so if the papacy isn't true, distinctive Catholic claims fall to the ground, just like if the resurrection isn't true, distinctive Orthodox claims similarly fall to the ground. Now, I would agree with this, that yeah, if the papacy is false, Catholicism is false. It is an essential doctrine. But that's not really what Dr. Walls is arguing at the beginning of this interview. He was more saying that we should have as much evidence for the papacy as we should have for the resurrection. We have all this evidence for the resurrection, but comparably weaker evidence for the papacy seemed to be the argument that he was making. And also, as I said earlier, the analogy is not a good one. It's not comparing the resurrection to the papacy. You'd be comparing the papacy to sola scriptura and a 27-book New Testament canon. That is the foundation of Protestantism, and that has far weaker evidence than something like the doctrine of uh, apostolic succession. So this argument, if it attempts to undermine Catholicism, also would undermine Protestantism as well. Here's a really good question from Joe Sharp. He says, Dr. Walls, if your argument against the papacy is true, wouldn't that just mean that Eastern Orthodoxy is true? Epic Pass has always offered great value and access to our world-class resorts like Vail, Park City, Breckenridge. With certainly, certainly. Uh... From Joe Sharp. He says, Dr. Walls, if your argument against the papacy is true, wouldn't that just mean that Eastern Orthodoxy is true? Certainly, certainly, uh, if, if your options are Roman Catholicism or Orthodoxy, it would certainly be a good reason to be Orthodox, right? Uh, I, I don't think I don't think the dispute is is ultimately reducible to that issue alone, but it would certainly be if for someone who's trying to choose between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, I think that would make it pretty clear. Yes, you ought to be Eastern Orthodox in that case. What are your What are your views on Eastern Orthodoxy? Why Why do you reject that view? Um. It's not so much a matter of deliberately rejecting it. I mean, uh, I was I was raised Protestant. I've been attending Protestant churches of various kinds. I attend an Episcopal church right now. 
uh, which is an excellent an excellent church. Um, find a you know place where the gospel is faithfully preached and and the like. So it's not like I have been looking you know uh, to change to change churches. Uh, if I was convinced that there was something heretical about my particular church, I couldn't hear the word of God faithfully preached. That might give me a good reason to to go to orthodoxy. But I guess I'm not convinced that. Um, that our only choices are Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. I mean, I think Orthodoxy certainly has problems of its own, as does Rome. I mean, I think both of them face some pretty serious questions and difficulties. All right, so here's a question. Well, notice it's interesting that when he looks to whether Catholicism is true, all Dr. Walls at he asks, okay, a, a essential doctrine for Catholicism is the papacy. Here are what Catholic scholars say. Problem is their claims undermine the papacy, so Catholicism's not true. Dr. Wallace then says, well, he's an Episcopalian. Why is he an Episcopalian? Well, I hear the gospel preached there. Notice there's no similar investigation made to say, okay, what is the central doctrine of Episcopalianism, and what is the evidence for that doctrine, like Sola Scriptura, for example? There's no search for that. Instead, Imagine if I told Dr. Wallace, well, I'm Catholic because I feel like I hear the gospel preached there really well. And he would probably say, okay, but what about all these other problems? Once again, if you're going to be skeptical and inquiring, uh, apply it. Evenly across the board would be another uh, takeaway lesson from this rebuttal and, and this interview. So it's interesting here that uh, it seems to me that if you have all this other evidence that, yeah, if you weren't Catholic, Eastern Orthodoxy would make the next sense uh, after that because it's the closest, the next closest thing to, to Catholicism. But instead, you go, you make this kind of longer leap that seems to be uh, unjustified and doesn't look at the evidence uh, as critically from Juan David. He says, I converted to Eastern Catholicism two weeks ago, so everything is related to authority and preeminence to confirm the faith of, of his brethren as Peter. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Um, I don't really have any any uh, thoughts on that. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I wanted to, to let everyone know, we're about to close this live stream out, but if you have a question for Dr. Walls related to his argument against Catholicism, try to put those in the live chat right now. I'll be, I'll be keeping a close eye on it. If you'd like to send it as a super chat, obviously that helps us out and I'll be able to, to get it on the screen immediately. But any other thoughts here? Um, I'm not sure what he, could, I'd like to know a little more what he means when he says everything is related to authority and preeminence to confirm the faith of his brethren as Peter. I'm not sure exactly what that means. I think he's referring to in the Gospel of Luke when Peter uh, sorry, when Jesus tells Peter, I have prayed for you, Peter, he says, uh, Jesus says to Peter in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Sa Satan has demanded to sift you all, the apostles like wheat, but I have prayed for you, singular, Peter, uh, that your faith may not fail. Uh, then uh, strengthen your brethren. I think he's referring to that, that scriptural evidence for the doctrine of the papacy, and in particular the infallibility of the papacy. Means so. I hesitate to address it when I'm not sure what it means, because I might, well, just be speaking beside the point. Fair enough. Uh, earlier in the in the stream, you mentioned that you have other problems with Roman Catholicism. Can you tell me uh, maybe one or two others that, that really give you pause and, and you worry about? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't buy the Marian dogmas. Um, there's a famous famous philosopher came came to HBU a year or two ago and, and asked him you know, why he wasn't Roman Catholic, and he said, I don't believe in the papacy, I don't believe the Marian dogmas, and that in many ways sums up the view that I hold as well. So I think the Marian dogmas are also lacking a biblical warrant, and I think, again, uh, Roman Catholicism has built itself a rather fragile foundation for its faith by making the Marian dogmas infallible, because if someone comes to a conviction, you know, if they come to doubt a Marian dogma, you necessarily doubt papal infallibility and papal authority, and of course you doubt papal authority and infallibility, you undermine the entire authority structure of the Roman Catholic Church. So, so Marian dogmas... Uh, uh, so by Marian know, dogmas, you mean the Immaculate Conception immaculate and... Immaculate Conception and Bodily Assumption. Yeah, those two. Right. Right. So, so, so... Which I've, I, I don't know if I'm... Oh, go ahead. If you make your entire faith hinge on the truth of those two doctrines, okay, neither one of them has anything remotely like a clear biblical warrant. Either one of them. And arguably, Immaculate Conception is denied by the claim that all people are sinful, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the, uh, the bodily assumption, I mean, that was, gosh, it was several hundred years before that, was, that became, that became uh, you know, common, common belief. So you're dealing, with, you're dealing with two doctrines, both of which have scant biblical support, and you're saying the entire faith. In fact, the Pope even said something to the effect that, that I guess, 
let me find the exact words he says on it. Um, if you deny this, you deny the entire Catholic faith. Is something along those lines, and that's a really that strikes me as a really extreme kind of a thing to say. But I can't can't put my finger. But he, but he says if you deny if you deny this Marian dogma, you deny the entire Catholic faith. Now that strikes me as not unlike a fundamentalist, you know, who says, well, you know, you, you deny, you know, that the, the axe floated, you know. Uh, or if you accept the, evolution, then you deny. You know. The whole faith is going down. Exactly. Exactly. So you're you're taking something that is at best relatively marginal to the faith, does not have a solid biblical foundation, and you're saying the entire faith now hinges on whether this is true or not. That strikes me as a matter of extreme imbalance. Well, the question is not whether it's extreme, but is it true? So there is a hierarchy of truths. So obviously, uh, the Trinity is more fundamental to the faith than the Assumption of Mary. One is more fundamental than the other. But they're both equally true. And so for us to believe it, one, we believe it because it's true. And two, we believe it because the, the teaching office of Christ's church uh, tells us to believe in it. We, so the question is not, is it extreme, but by what authority am I following? If the authority that I'm listening to has Christ's authority, then to not listen would be to ignore Christ himself. Luke 10, 16, Jesus tells the apostles, he who hears you hears me. We can infer from that, he who rejects you rejects me. In fact, that's what Jesus told the apostles at one point. In John 20, 23, he tells them, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, and whose sins you retain are retained. But the other element that I would bring up with Dr. Walls is this, who decides what's essential and not essential? When you don't have this teaching authority, I would say to Dr. Walls, he says, well, how could the assumption be, be that crucial to the, the Christian faith? I could bring up other doctrines that, that Christians disagree on. I would say to Dr. Walls, um, is the existence of hell a essential element of the Christian faith? If you deny the reality of hell, especially if you deny hell, either eternal hell or annihilation in hell, and you're a universalist, and you say everybody's going to heaven. So you're not really denying... I know a lot of universalists, they don't deny hell, they just treat hell like purgatory. So I would say, Dr. Wallace, look, if someone believes everybody's going to heaven no matter what, uh, would that deny a fundamental element of the Christian faith? Would it? And especially for somebody who wrote a book defending the doctrine of hell, I'm not sure what his answer would be. I would think it should tread closer to, yeah, if you don't, if Christianity is about salvation, what are we really being saved from if everybody's going to heaven no matter what? Or is the Trinity fundamental? Are you saying Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons can never be Christian because they have a, just a different theology in that regard? So it's not about, is it extreme? It is, do we listen? What is the nature of the authority that tells us what is and isn't essential? And does it have the historical pedigree to have that proper apostolic authority? Question that was... Uh that was raised by Av, Av Christus Rex. Anyways. Higher Catholic faith. Now that strikes me as not unlike a fundamentalist, you know, who says, well, you know, you, you deny, you know, that the, the axe floated, you know. Uh, or if you accept the, evolution, then you deny. No. The whole faith is going down. Exactly, exactly. So you're, you're taking something that is at best relatively marginal to the faith, does not have a solid biblical foundation, and you're saying the entire faith now hinges on whether this is true or not. That strikes me as a matter of extreme imbalance. All right, here's actually a good question that was uh, that was raised by Av Av Christus Rex. Anyways, uh, what scriptural proof for the papacy would Doctor Walls accept in scripture, if not for Jesus renaming Peter to Kephas, giving him the keys to the church and heaven-backed authority? This is always an important question to ask someone when they hold a particular position. Uh, it's not applicable to all positions, but it's always important to ask. Like, I like to ask atheists, okay, what would convince you that God exists, for example? And if nothing would convince them, then their position has a very stubborn quality about it that makes it somewhat unreasonable. So what I would say to Dr. Walls is, yeah, what evidence would convince you of the papacy? And this is going to be a part of my argument against Protestantism, that if this certain evidence, if it re would require this much evidence to convince you of apostolic succession or the papacy, and there is not that much evidence for Protestantism, not just Christianity, but Protestantism, like Sola Scriptura, then your argument against Catholicism is going to cut off Protestantism at the root as well, which, which, is, um, which would be a problem for a Protestant like Jerry Walls and others. What scripture proof for the papacy? Uh, well, I mean, the, the, those passages have alternative interpretations, and uh, my colleague Craig Evans, for instance, has just written a really interesting article uh, on on that matter. And um, uh, Protestant biblical authorities have no problem whatever interpreting those texts and making perfectly good sense of what Jesus is saying. 
without uh, without buying the Roman Catholic line. So, you know, I, I would like... And Jehovah's Witnesses uh, can interpret the Bible, even using the non-Jehovah's Witness translation, their garbled translation. They can interpret it a different way. Or uh, Muslims, Jews, or, or how about Oneness Pentecostals who deny the Trinity? They can interpret the Bible a particular way. Uh, Dr. Walls has criticized Calvinism. Uh, you know, he, he's critical of Calvinism, uh, and I'm sure he would assess the evidence much more carefully there, but I highly doubt Dr. Walls would accept as a sufficient response from a Calvinist someone saying, well, Dr. Walls, you make this argument against Calvinism, but Calvinist scholars can interpret those verses in a different way. If Dr. Walls would not accept that reply from a Calvinist when he launches a critique of Calvinism, why should uh, he allow Protestants to make a similar reply when Catholics make a similar critique of Protestantism? Like, I would like some clear, uh, some clear evidence that Peter was, in fact, the first pope. And again, I, here's something I find very, very interesting, okay? So, so Paul... Uh, becomes the most prominent apostle in the book of Acts after after Acts chapter 15. And there's far more far more space given to the ministry of Paul than there is to the ministry of Peter. Now, what I find really interesting in this line is that there's detailed account of how Paul goes to Rome. We have nothing like that with respect to Peter. Now, in the book of First Peter, he does refer to Babylon, which gives us reason to think he was in Rome. So I'm not I'm not saying he wasn't in Rome, but all I'm saying is it is not by any means a biblically prominent doctrine. But you've got this detailed account. One of the longest chapters in the book of Acts is Paul's ship, you know, Paul's ship journey uh, to 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 the city of Rome, and then the account of how Paul is ministering in in the city of Rome once he gets there. Nothing like that with respect to Peter, right? So I find this very surprising and very ironic. I mean, I mean, you would think, given the alleged importance of Peter going to Rome, that if anybody's account of going to Rome would be given in detail, it would be Peter's, right? So I, I just, I just think that the the biblical data as a whole, you know, Peter simply falls out of the narrative after after I think it's Acts 15, uh, the 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 church council there. He falls out of the book of Acts, and you never hear another word from him. Right, and uh, uh, I simply think the lack of evidence for the papacy biblically, um, I, I think I, I think there's not enough evidence for it, uh, even even close. To the, to All right, the, so we've got a. Okay, well, when it comes to the silence in the Book of Acts about uh, what Peter was doing, there's an easy explanation for that, and for although also when it comes to Peter in Rome, we have the evidence in the New Testament, but also the extremely strong extra biblical evidence. That is so strong, even Protestant scholars like Sean McDowell and others, as I referenced earlier, agree that, that Peter was in Rome, at least at the, at the end of his life, that he, he was there. Now, as for that evidence in uh, the book of Acts as to why Peter is missing, here's the explanation. Acts was written by Luke, and probably at that point in the narrative, Luke was a traveling companion to Peter. I'm sorry, to Paul. Luke was a traveling companion to Paul. And we see that in what have been scholars called the we passages in the book of Acts. So, for example, when you go to Acts 16.10, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of He had a dream. Paul had a dream about a man of Macedonia was standing, beseeching him, and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision immediately, this is in Acts 16.10, we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us, us, to preach the gospel to them. So here it seems that Luke is writing in these we and plural passages and describes Paul's journey because he was there. He's not just a chronicler of it. He's recounting that, that he was actually alongside with it. That's, I think, a perfectly valid explanation of these passages in the book of Acts. It also explains how Paul, he mentions Luke and is familiar with Luke and calls him the beloved physician in the letter to the Colossians. We've got another super chat from Barely Protestant, and this one is a, is a question. Dr. Walls, do you think that we as Protestants have shot ourselves in the foot for denying our Catholicity in the historical sense? Yes, yes. In fact, one of the things I did uh, uh, for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, I, uh, I led a group which, uh, which produced a reforming Catholic confession of the faith that was signed by a number of Protestant Christians and leaders, and uh, in that uh, in that document we affirm traditional Catholic Christianity as spelled out in the in the creeds. And uh, so, what he means by Catholic is just universal. What he sees as the essential universal teachings of the early Church that Protestants have continued to teach. Uh, yes, I think Protestants have made a big mistake uh, by not having more clear root within the creeds and the classic confessions. 
so I guess I, I think we very much need to reassert and um, uh, restore our identity as Catholic Christians. I think that's very important. All right. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're going back to the early church, it's not just what is in the creeds, but it's also in how the faith is lived out, how it's practiced liturgically, the other beliefs that were universal in the church that are not explicitly spelled out in the creeds. Those are also things that need to be taken into account. And when Dr. Wallace says, yeah, well, Protestants today, we have the essentials that the early church had. The, then the next question raises, of course, well, how do you know what the essentials are uh, that the early church taught? We're, you know, we're carrying on those same traditions. Uh, in an article, and I'll link some of the articles here below the video if you want to read them, I accuse Dr. Wallace of committing what is called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. And it goes like this, a Texas sharpshooter, there's a guy in Texas, the best shooter in Texas, and he shot. He shoots a bunch of holes in the side of a barn, and he paints targets around the holes afterwards, and he tells people he's the greatest sharpshooter in Texas. Of course, what's wrong with this uh, line of reasoning? He's not a great sharpshooter because he paints the targets after the bullets have struck the side of the barn. Much the same way, what are the essential doctrines of the early church? Well, they happen to be the ones that Protestants all agree upon. So it's kind of like you're painting the target around the bullet holes instead of saying, wow, it turns out that Protestants all believe what were the and only the essential doctrines of the early church. When it turns out most Protestants reject what the early Christians believed uh, about the Mass. Many of them reject what they believed about baptism, uh, about the nature of the afterlife, like purgatory. Uh, and they believe things the early Christians did not believe, like Sola Scriptura or, or Sola Fide. And you check the—I'll put some link to the, the articles below for that. Right, I think that's going to do it for us. So is there anything that you'd like to leave with the audience? Uh, we already mentioned at the very beginning your book on the subject, Roman But Not Catholic. And as I said, that is conveniently linked for you in the description of this video. So if you'd like to pick it up, go click on it, go pick it up. It's a pretty thick book. They've got a lot of material in here. I, uh, I reference this a lot in my studies, so it's a, it's a very, very good book. Highly recommend getting it. Uh, but is there anything that you'd like to leave with the audience for today? Well, again, I you know I just uh, want to reassert my uh, my fellowship with my Roman Catholic brothers and uh, the privilege of talking about these issues in a friendly and gracious way. And I would be happy to talk about this issue in a gracious way with Dr. Walls if that uh, opportunity ever presents itself in the future. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this rebuttal. It's nice to get back in the the saddle and do that. Uh, if you like these rebuttals that we're, we're doing, I want to do even more of them. I'd love to get lots and lots of rebuttals up. So much content on YouTube, so little time to rebut, but it's important to do that. And I want to keep doing that. And I want to keep doing debates and dialogues. So like with Dr. Walls and with other individuals, with atheists, with non-Christians, I want to keep it going. And we need your help to do that, to make this, this channel possible and our podcast possible. So if you want to support what we're doing here, I would highly encourage you to go to trendhornpodcast.com. You can make a monthly contribution or an annual contribution. You get access to bonus content. You make this YouTube channel and podcast possible. I'm always appreciative of that. Uh, thank you guys so much, uh, and I hope that you have a really blessed day. If you want more on some of these subjects, check out my book, The Case for Catholicism. But otherwise, have a blessed day, everybody.